Okay, so I got a big choice ahead of me. Do content, do me. I want to do media analysis, but I have a lot of stuff I want to cover. But how should I do it? How should I start? No. No, I'm not starting with you! Get out of my face! <laughs> okay. Now that he's gone, uh, back to my train of thought. Maybe I should just... Yeah, this should work. Now I can surprise people with this video, as long as they ignore the thumbnail and title. Okay. Owl House. I could do that. It's only... the third largest thing on Tumblr right now. I think I just got myself into a much bigger hole than I realized. Hello everyone, welcome to the darkness, and I am Darkness Stone. As you can see, I've done some remodeling. I don't think that gameplay footage would have worked well with my new style of content, so my girlfriend and I put some ideas together and made this place in the darkness. So that explains the change in background. Onto the stuff you came here for. The Owl House. This right here is my favorite. The Owl House was an animated show on the Disney Channel running from January 10th, 2020 to April 8th, 2023. It was a big success right out of the gate, getting picked up for a second season before even premiering. It was created by the amazing Donna Terrace, who worked on the show's Gravity Falls and the DuckTales reboot before pitching her own show, The Owl House, before being greenlit alongside the show Amphibia in 2018. Maybe I should look into Amphibia later. Um, once released, the show was heavily loved and supported by its own community, making fan art and AUs galore, giving me Undertale flashbacks, but it was great nonetheless. I follow Morning Mark Mark on Twitter, so I know a bit about the show through his comics and AUs, but eh, I don't know too much. I do know some, I do know some things from, I believe, seasons two and three. Just as the story went on, more and more people got sucked in, and the fandom became huge. Hell, I remember going to my state's renaissance fair and seeing an Ida cosplayer walking around. This success allowed it to get a third and final season consisting of three hour-long specials. However, not everything was sunshine and rainbows. Specifically rainbows. As there was problems going on behind the scenes. Uh, Disney was not pleased with the LGBTQ plus representation in the show. Even though a vast majority of the fans were extremely happy about it or were in least indifferent canceling the Owl House, saying it did not fit with the Disney brand. Yikes. This caused a huge uproar in the community, but the show managed to get its final three specials in, and after those were set up for release, Donatero left working for Disney, which I can only imagine is from how the company treated her while working on the Owl House project. She hasn't ruled out more Owl House in the future, but that's for a later time. Stop! Hey, Future Stone here, after writing this full script. Uh, I have been made aware of this tweet by Donna saying that she would likely not take part in any future Owl House stuff, since so it's now Disney property, and she wants to flex her creative muscles elsewhere. She also doesn't want to work in the kids' media space anymore. All of this is fully understandable, and I can only wish the best for her in her future projects. Now back to your, reg now back to your regularly scheduled YouTube content. With that being said, I have only seen the first nine episodes of the first season because life got in the way back when the show originally aired. But since I am now a media channel, this gives me an excuse to give it a full watch. So today we're going to go through the first season of The Owl House and see what it did right and wrong, and give my general opinions upon it. Episode by episode. We have 19 episodes to go through, so I think there has been enough exposition. But before we begin, we must explain something. My rating system. I have a fairly basic rating system going from 0 to 10. 10 is the perfect episode of a show. Great in many aspects, story, animation, music, it's got all the beats. 9.9 .9 to 7 is a really good episode, something I would happily watch again. 
Good work done, good story, animation, story beats, makes it entertaining and a good watch. 6.9 The 5 is an okay episode. Not the best, but not the worst. An average episode. Not really something I would watch often, but if I would not turn my nose to it if it was there and it has some redeeming qualities. But it's just not for me. It would usually have something obvious I'm not a fan of. 4.9 to 2 is not a good episode. It may have some redeeming qualities, but it's just not for me. It's I have obvious gripes that all state. It's not something I would like to rewatch, but will if it calls for it or I have literally nothing else to watch. 1.9 and lower is something I would, would not want to revisit even if I had to. I would have big issues with the episode or something I or it has something I actively despise. It is a terrible episode that shouldn't be on TV for some reason. Bad quality, extremely offensive or dated jokes that aren't funny in the slightest, bad audio mixing or animation, completely problematic character actions that go against character, the works. I can't personally think of anything right now that would give this ranking aside from anything from Phoenix Games. Don't think I don't remember Snow White and the Seven Clever Boys. But one day it may end up in a way of an actual good piece of media. Then I explain myself so that I'm not completely crucified and thrown to a low budget air fryer. Let us begin. I'm going to admit, for a pilot episode, it's a solid start. This episode lays the foundation really well, showing two conflicting worlds of the series. In this episode, after some hiccups with the school because it loses creativity, she is sent to summer camp to help curve out her, her eccentric habits. She throws away her favorite book, but goes back for it, following an owl to an abandoned house and end up going through a strange door to a land called the Boiling Isles. She meets the Owl Lady, or Ida, who is voiced by the recognizable talent of Wendy Malick, who voiced Beatrice Horseman and Bojack Horseman and uh, Cheetah from Emperor's New Groove. After nearly getting arrested for just being strange, and for Ida, who's a wanted criminal, but we'll get to that later, they make it to the aptly titled Owl House, meeting Hootie and King, both voiced by Alex Hirsch, the creator of Gravity Falls and the voice of Uncle Stan, some great voice talent thus far. They go to get King's crown from the Conformatorium, which turns out to just be a brand safe Burger King crown, but it was important to him, and Luz discovers that people are being arrested just for being strange. Like, someone got locked up for writing fan fiction. Fan fiction. Like, if that was the case, I'm pretty sure 60% of teenagers would be hardened criminals by this point. After a daring speech and a jailbreak, they return to the Owl House and Luz decides to stay in the Boiling Isles instead of returning to summer camp, ending on a nice note with Luz texting their mom. Now I'm gonna say it, this is a very good pilot episode, but there are some minor hiccups, mostly in the animation. Like, seeing the owl entering the abandoned house kind of threw me off, as well as the action shot when Luz and the rest were thrown off the broom, as well as some other things, but they were way overshadowed by the sheer greatness of the vocal delivery, writing, and some clever animation. Like, I love this little animation of Luz just trying to grip at King. On the art standpoint, the show has some beautiful backgrounds in art. Each background looks like it was a painting in and of itself, and having a good amount of detail while not being distracting. Also, Writing was on point, and the line delivery really hit the spot. I found myself laughing at many points throughout the episode, just from the jokes, vocal delivery, and expressions. The GIVE ME YOUR SKIN! <laughs> clip had me laughing each time I looked over the episode. Ida, Luz, and King are all well characterized, Luz being a young and naive girl with a great imagination and a drive to share her creativity. Ida is a goofy yet strong-willed witch who holds freedom in great value. And King is a demon who apparently has great power hidden somewhere behind all the cuteness and cuddles. This episode packs a lot of stuff in, and I will say it's paced really well. So far I think Luz is my favorite character, but I have to see how the show goes on in my opinion to see if it shifts. If you are on the fence about watching the show, I'd say give it a first episode a shot. The only thing I'm confused about is the phone signal going through the mentions, but... We'll hand wave that for now. I'll give this episode a 9 out of 10 and very well done, especially for a pilot episode. It was very close to getting a 10 for me, but the animation mishaps and some of the other small things kept it from that. Well done, Owl House. Great start. In 
this episode, Luz goes on an errand for Ida, beginning her witch apprenticeship. Luz asks for her staff, and Ida explains that she will get one eventually after working with her for a while. She is to deliver potions around the city of Burnsboro, a city in the Boiling Isles. With this quest, she comes to terms with that this magical world is much more bleak and less epic fantasy than she thinks, until she meets a wizard. He talks Luz up, saying that he has a quest for a chosen one if they think themselves worthy, as King is talking down to him, saying he's just a man in pajamas. When Luz gets home and starts to pack for the quest, Ida and King laugh it off, and Luz asks for some alone time, where she sneaks off to go on the quest and follow the map the wizard has provided her. She meets some characters that are classic character stereotypes. The Edgelord with a heart of gold who talks about love with Luz, Netherith Blade Strife Teen Prince of Inksmore, who rips off his shirt and gives it to Luz as a cape, a gnome fella named Chris who gives a riddle and then gives Luz a ring, and a fairy who just goes by Princess who gives Luz some bracelets. This whole adventure fed into the fantasy that Luz wanted. Eden King, however, investigate and find the whole situation is different. The castle they went to earlier was broken down. The city that Luz went to was too overgrown and broken. Ida realizes that this is the work of a puppeteer, a demon who is like King, whose name is Adagast. Luz realized she was being tricked, breaking out of the magic and getting chained up by the shirt, necklace, and ring that turned the magical restraints. Ida tries to come to the rescue, but gets trapped, and Luz is offered to stay in the magical hallucinations. She refuses, and they fight off the demon, which Ida eats! Which I wasn't expecting. To give Luz some much needed hope, Ida takes Luz to the edge of the Boiling Isles, showing her the bones of the Isles, the landmark of the giant skeleton where people have made their homes, saying that she might not get her staff now, but she will with time. Episode 2 of the show has a lot of ups and downs for me. I enjoyed it well, and its satire on the chosen story was compelling. And as always, the vocal performance was great, but that's also what brought it down for me. The voice acting was so good, it made me want to take the jabs at the stereotypes seriously, causing me to physically cringe when, where I almost wanted to pause it. The part that specifically got me was the whole lose, do you believe that love can bloom on the battlefield line from the Angst Prince? Like, jeez. It was voice acting so well, it just made me feel off. It was immediately followed up by a joke, so that helped, but I don't know if I should knock it for that or praise it. I still prefer the first episode to this one, but this episode is still a strong contender with strong visuals, we get to see a new point at the Isles, we get to see some of the creatures there, we get some more monsters designs, etc. The episode is strong visually, it also plays into the na uh, naive nature of Luz, uh, being in a new world and not knowing who to trust or how to spot signs of an untrustworthy person. It gives good character development. So I would rate this episode, I'd give it about a 7 out of 10. Very good, but it could be better in my opinion. I feel like this episode would hit harder for others than it does for me. Episode 3, or I Was a Teenage Abomination, is a very good jumping point from the last episode when it comes to Luz's reservation to Ida's teaching skills. In this episode, after doing some digging in a trash lug, Luz hears about a magical school in the area and goes off to find it, hoping to see she can learn a thing or two that Ida wasn't sharing. After discovering Willow, a girl from the school, and being introduced to Amity, a top student of the class who was looking and talking down to Willow, Willow lets out a wave of nature magic in a fit of frustration, accidentally pulling Luz out from her hiding spot and her meeting Willow now. Doing so, it is discovered that Luz is a human, and that she offers to help Willow with a school assignment on Abominations, which Luz would pose as, as long as Willow shows them around the magical school. Luz finds her way into the magical school of this world, Hexide School of Magic and Demonics through Willow, and eventually meeting Augustus, who Luz gives the nickname of Gus, who is the president of the Human Appreciation Club, or HAC. Eventually, the assignment comes up, and with Luz's help, Willow aces her assignment and gets the top student badge, which heavily upsets Amity, who tries to confront them twice, the second time getting sent to Principal Bump's office. During all this, Ida and King make a bet to see if King could train a slug to be his minion, showing that he can be a better teacher than Ida. It is shown that um, King has never won a bet against Ida, so his prospects are not looking great. He gorges the slugs with dog treats, making it only follow orders when given them. Ida then discovers that Luz went to the magic school, losing the bet, and sulking. 
However, the slugs goes out of control when he runs out of treats and, and King begs Ida for help, saying he admits defeat and Ida takes out the slug with some salt. Back to Luz. Bump comes to check out this new abomination that was supposedly so great. After almost getting dissected, Luz and Willow make an escape and quickly followed by Bump, Amity, and a small army of abominations. Luz makes a seed that she got from Ida at the start of the episode and pulls it out, which Willow uses her splendid nature magic to trap Bump and the other abominations. Willow makes sure Luz can escape after trapping Amity, and Luz runs back to home for help. Willow and Gus follow shortly after, saying that things ended up better than they thought. Willow has now moved to the plant magic classes because of how impressed Bump was with her plant magic. However, the downside of that is Luz is now banned from the school. Willow and Gus say they will be willing to come to teach Luz what they know, though. However, Luz decides to go with Edith's teaching instead. I feel like this episode would have been a much better episode too, including some of the major secondary characters in the series from what I've seen, I could be wrong, such as Amity, Willow, and Gus. Expanding more on the magical world and showing us some more spells, but I understand how the second episode came into play, planting doubts in Luz's head that bubbled up in this episode. There were a lot of fun details in this episode when it came to the school, such as humans are well known enough that they can be commonly identified by their ears not having points from a, a basic teenager like Willow, how tracks or paths of learning the students are on are based on the color of their uniform, such as purple for the abomination track or green for the plan track, and how much normal school things in the magical world are alive, like the lockers and the school bell. A lot of detail went into making this school a place that would normally be dull and have dull environments become alive. As well, we also get to see a lot of magic in this episode, such as the abominations, purple goop monsters that can be animated and reanimated multiple times using magic. We also see a ceiling spell that Bump uses to lock the section of the school down, and Willow turning a seed into a full-blown vine forest. It shows a couple of things about this world, such as how some people might have an affinity for special types of magic over others. Willow is a prime example. She says that she's not great on the Abomination track, but has visibly seen how gifted she is when it comes to the plant track, showing it twice throughout the episode. We don't know what Gus is at this point, but I'm sure we'll learn it eventually. We also learned that Ida has a distaste for general education, the bad girl attitude, but this episode was a joy to watch, even though I don't to care too much for the Ida and King story. It did flesh out their characters a bit though, so that helped. If I were to rate this episode, it would be an 8.5 out of 10. A solid episode, a great amount of stuff for the future of the show planned. The Intruder is another splendid episode with a lot of lore implications for the rest of the series. At the beginning of the episode, King is teaching Luz about demons, but she is struggling to keep focus. A rainstorm comes in, but it's not any normal rainstorm, it's a boiling rainstorm, which means boiling water is raining down from the sky. This makes Ida set up a barrier to keep the house safe from the rain, and this tires her out. Luz, however, wants to learn magic, and in return for that, she will give Ida her light-up pen that Ida wants for her nest. She shows Luz the light spell, and how bigger spell circles means more power. She also learns that witches have sacks connected to their hearts that allow them to cast spells in such a way, but Luz, being a human, does not have one, so they are unsure how to progress. To allow Edith to nap, Luz convinces Edith to give one more example of the spell as Luz records it so she can study it. This, however, tires Edith out so much that she passes out. They put Ida to bed in her nest, and King makes a deal with Luz that if King can help her figure out magic, she will listen to his demon lesson. He shares his theory on how Ida does magic with a potion she keeps in her room. They try to make Luz take the potion, or the elixir, but she drops it and the glass breaks. Then the house starts to shake violently and the lights go out, eventually discovering something is attacking Hootie, a large beast which Kings assumes is the Snaggleback, a demon who hunts in the boiling rain and is one of the most dangerous demons. Ida is missing and they begin to be chased around the house by the monster. King gets separated from Luz and chases the beast around, eventually finding the real Snaggleback, which is nothing like it is in the book. The Snaggleback gets eaten and King gets chased, but saved by Luz. They discover the potion Luz is going to drink was the elixir that kept the curse at bay, a curse that affected Ida that turned her into the monster attacking the house. 
Ida finds them and chases them, but they eventually escape. Luz and King have a heart to heart. They try to think up a plan to fight against this monster Ida. They believe she has an aversion to light, and Luz looks at the video of Ida doing the light spell with her now cracked phone. This glitches, however, and shows her a magical circle, which she traces with a pencil and a light spell is cast by tapping it. Luz discovers that humans can cast spells through magical circles and comes up with a plan with King to lure Ida to a large light circle. This frees Ida and they force her to drink the elixir as she is knocked out. She recovers and she has a dream about the person who cursed her. The episode ends with Luz practicing her magical circles, helping Hootie, and King talking to the snuggleback who got hacked up, he saying he needs to edit the version of him in the demon book. This episode was great. A lot of good animation, great story, good suspense, a lot of additions to the lore of this world too. For one, the curses are a thing. Good to know. And humans can cast magic, just in a different way. So there's a way for a human to become a witch. As well, it seems that casting spells this way for Luz doesn't take up any stamina, like a normal spell casting for witches do. Because at the end of the episode, we can see she has made dozens of light bulbs in Ida's room and she has no signs of exhaustion. Lastly, we have seen both dangerous and weak demons now. Like the episode 2 with the Adagast for a strong one and now the Snaggleback for a weak one in episode 4. We don't know how powerful King is yet, so we don't know where he is on that spectrum. This episode has a lot of great animation by the way with the chase scenes, them moving and twisting through the halls, and Ida's curse form flowing as it collided with the walls. It reminds me of a lot of Spirited Away in that sense, where Shihiro was running from No Face. Who knows, it might be a reference. This episode had a lot of losing King bonding, great development for Ida, and just an overall solid story. All settled in within one location. I don't really have any complaints, but I can't say it was an extraordinary episode that blew me out of the water. A 9 out of 10, great episode. Solid. This episode starts with Luz, Ida, and King running their human good stand, realizing no one is around, not even other stands. Gus and Willow come to tell Luz about the annual... Coven Enchin, or Coven Convention, I'm just going to call it a convention, uh, because Coven Enchin is hard to say. Covens are a group of witches and wizards based on a specific theme of magic, and this event is similar to a job fair. We learn that most covens place a seal on the witch, limiting their magic to a specific type, like an illusionist coven will only allow you to cast illusion spells, or strength spells for the construction coven. Ida proclaims that she is stronger than all of these people in these covens because she is without a coven meaning she can do any type of magic she pleases and isn't bound to just one type. We also see glyphs that seem to do magical effects on a person if they are attached to it, keeping that in mind for later. King during all of this is entranced by the free things that these covens are giving out, seeing them as offerings to his greatness. We then meet the Emperor's Coven, seeming to be the most popular, having a large show area for their event, with Gus and Willow being extremely excited just to be there. Luz and Ida end up watching the presentation and learn about the coven. Made of the best of the best witches, these witches and wizards can practice every kind of magic, and we learn that Amity wants to be part of said coven. We also meet Lilith, a witch who is the leader of the coven, who Ida seems to have a history with. This coven is stated to follow the Emperor's will. After the show, Ida runs into Amity, still holding a grudge from before at the school, claiming that humans can't be witches. After disrespecting King, Luz and Amity enter a witch's duel, signed by a magical deal using something called an everlasting oath, that if Luz wins, Amity will admit that humans can be witches and will apologize to King, but if Amity wins, Luz will have to admit humans cannot be witches and Luz must stop learning how to become a witch. They set the duel time from an hour from then. Ida runs up to Lilith and claims that their apprentice is better, and because of Luz, they learn about the witch's duel. Lilith makes it so that Ida will not be hunted down at the convention so that her and Luz could prepare for the witch's duel. Ida comes up with a plan to cheat, setting minds around the arena. It will learn that Amity is Lilith's pupil. The time arrives and the battle begins. As Amity summons an abomination, she seems surprised and sticks it on Luz. It sips on a few minds and they learn that Ida and Luz were cheating. They also learn that Lilith was cheating, placing a glyph on the back of Amity's neck from the construction coven making her more powerful, and now we can see that it's not just physical but also magical strength. 
That's why Amity was so surprised while summoning her abomination. She was powered up without knowing it. Amity runs off in shame and Ida taunts Lilith, and they eventually begin a witch's duel of their own. Luz finds Amity, and they have a small discussion, Luz learning about Amity's insecurities and how she's been working her whole life to become a powerful witch. Luz shows her her magic, showing that she's trying to become a witch too. Amity relates to Luz, undoing the magical seal from her duel, and walking away saying that even though humans lack magical ability, it wouldn't stop Luz. Ida and Lilith are fighting during this, and we see a lot of spells like teleportation, fire blast, a giant wooden hoodie with many heads, and we learn that Lilith knows about Ida's curse. After, dis after a distraction, Ida runs off, seeing how Lilith is her sister, and they should leave before Lilith realizes that Ida tied her shoes laced together. The episode ends with Lilith returning home and getting a call from a mysterious person, saying how Ida should have been captured and, and for her to remember what Emperor Bellos promised Lilith. Now, this was a great episode, having a lot of bombastic moments and some great effects for spells. This episode heavily fleshed out the world even more, giving up covens, new spells, glyph patches, the Emperor's Coven, Lilith as a character, and now a somewhat understanding between Luz and Amity. We learned that there are nine main covens, and we get to see a few, like the Construction Coven, and I also assume the Emperor's Coven is counted as one of the main nine, but I don't know if that's directly stated. We also see a ton of other covens in the background, like the Cat, Fashion, Cantrip, Cooking, Debate, Fortune Telling, Meditation, Scrying, and a lot more. We also learn through context that Gus is a part of the Illusionist tract of the school, his blue sleeve matching those of the Illusionist coven, and him being seen using Illusionist magic. The fight between Ida and Lilith was a sight to behold, with silky smooth animation and large spells and set pieces. The giant wooden hoodie spell was awesome, and if it was casted by a different witch, I'm sure it would look different based on their staff or spellcasting style. The flow of the light fight was great, even if it was short. They put their whole hoodie into this, I'm sure. The episode has also put a lot into perspective when it comes to the Emperor. He has a whole coven just to himself, and these witches and wizards can use any spell, which, is, make, which makes them more powerful than a normal coven witch or wizard. They might not match Ida, but that doesn't make them any less of a threat. That means, unless a coven member is extremely good with their spells, a coven member of another coven may not have a chance to fight against a member of the Emperor's coven. They might not just have a chance to win, because the sheer amount of spells of the Emperor coven's disposal. These are listed as the best of the best, so that must say a lot for those who the Emperor has on his payroll. We also learned the name of the Emperor in this episode, Bellos. Bolo seems to have a lot of people under his command, some who are not even magical, like the ones we saw in episode 1 trying to arrest either of the guards. The music accompanying this episode was great too, giving all the great cues when things happen. Lilith, even, through ju even though judgmental, still seems to care a lot for Ida, which is understandable, a sibling dynamic, but it shows good contrast in her character. She cares for Ida, but also wants to arrest her or have her join the coven. She's giving Ida options, but neither of what Ida wants, which frustrates Lilith. This episode has a lot going for it. Great music, animation, vocal deliveries are great, even though there aren't that many standout moments of them this episode, and lots of lore and story beats that are needed to continue the story and flesh out this world. A great, almost perfect episode for the spot for this spot in the series. If it was too early, I might have felt a bit forced, or if it was too late, I might have been just seeing dumping story stuff to get the larger bits, but putting it here makes a lot of sense and adds a lot to it. I would give this episode a 9.5 out of 10. Great work. In this episode, we learn about Ida's favorite game, Hexus Hold'em. And after a game, Ida's curse starts popping up again, but she's out of elixirs. So they head to the town to find some. As they wait for the store to open, they learn about demon hunters who fight and sell demons. We also get to see Gus and Willow who seem to be bummed out. It turns out once a year there is a moonlight conjuring where people use their power of the moonlight to animate objects. Ida says no to them doing it in their house, and Ida learned that she will have to go to the night market to find her elixir. When night comes, Ida heads out with King, and once they leave, Willow and Gus enter the owl house. They find a doll or figurine as Gus claims trying to animate it using the moon's magic. This backfires, however, animating the house rather than the doll, taking over Hootie and making him walk on some owl slash chicken legs. 
They learned that they can control it by holding hands in a circle, like the Moonlight Conjuring, and use it for a joyride, even though Luz is nervous about it, but thinks they have time before the moon sets. They then prank one of Amity's friends, who decides to take the house to Amity's to show off. When they get there, however, the house is captured by demon hunters. Ida during this has found a potion salesman, Tiblet Tibly Grimhammer III, or he just likes to go by Tibbles. He tries to overprice Ida, but then she challenges to a game of Hexus Hold'em. If she wins, she gets the potion, but if she loses, he gets something of hers. Tibbles wins, and he takes King, chains up Ida, and calls the Emperor's Coven to arrest her. While this is going on, the hunters tie up the kids and call for Hootie, the house demon, to be ripped out, and the kids to be thrown off the cliff. The three get thrown off, but get caught on a branch. We learned that Willow and Amity used to be friends when they were kids, but when Amity got her magic and Willow didn't, they stopped hanging out. She just wanted to show off to Amity to show that she is still a good witch. Willow manages to get her hand free and manages to use some plant magic to save them and get them back to the house, where they are rushed back home. Doing so destroys the stand that Ida was stuck at, getting her elixir and allowing her to escape. Dibbles cursing them into the night. She comes home and sees that Luz is in trouble, but Willow and Gus stand up for her. They are punished by having to clean up the house, but Ida says excitedly that she'll be joining them for the next year's ritual. Then there is a comment made by Ida saying that it would have taken some powerful magic to raise a house like that, making her wonder. The episode ends at Amity's house, where they see through social media that Gus, Willow, and Luz have raised a house from the ground using it as a ritual, causing them to yell in shock. Yes, yes, this episode was pretty good. Not my favorite, but still solid. We see a lot of flaws in Ida's character, showing how impulsive she is when it came to the pen in the Intruder episode and now with Hexus Hold'em. It's a good for a character to have these faults, but the one thing I just don't understand is the bet she made with Tibbles. She worded it so vaguely it was obvious that he would have chosen King or her staff or both things Ida wouldn't have wanted to give up, so I don't know why she wouldn't make more strict terms. The Demon Hunter, on the other hand, does show another side out of this world. These guys are just as cruel and unfeeling, willing to kill children for profit, which they try to do by throwing the crew off the cliff. It shows that this attitude is normalized enough that they can just do this, either that or they're being active criminals, uh, as well as we learn that social media exists here through a scroll-like thing that is used like a phone. We learn that Amity is also most likely not just a skilled witch, but also wealthy, living at a manor. Edith's curse is also given more info. The more the curse progresses, the less magic she can use, and trying to use it only causes it to spread faster. One thing I do appreciate is a consistent array of returning background characters, like the little conspiracy fella from the first episode, who was in the last episode too, and this time through a social media post. We also see a guy who eats his own eyeballs from episode 1 in a social media post. This episode does a, is more of a fun episode, having the least amount of lore implications thus far, but still silly and fun, which is nice. However, so far, this is my least favorite episode. Does it make it bad? No, far from it. I still enjoyed it and a few points made me laugh, but it didn't fully save it. It just felt almost like a filler episode. I'd give it a 6.5 out of 10. Still good, just not the best. Episode 7 follows two plot lines, the Ida and King line and the Luz line. The story starts out with Luz reading the Good Witch Azora 5 book to King, when a parcel is delivered to the Owl House, which has bat demon babies inside. It is signed by the Bat Queen, the richest demon on the Boiling Isles, that they need Ida to watch them and will pay Ida handsomely for it. While she does this, Luz is told to return some library books. Doing so, she hears about the Wailing Star, which is supposed to fly overhead that night. Luz explores the libraries, eventually finding Amity in there reading books to children, seeming to have a softer side, even though she says she only is doing it for extra credit. After Amity tells Luz to leave, and that whenever Luz shows up something bad happens for her, Luz meets Emera and Edric, Amity's older siblings, who tease Amity and invite Luz to hang out after pulling some pranks. The invite is to return to the library at midnight during the Wailing Star, because apparently something magical happens. Amity overhears this and makes plans to go there that night as well. During this, Ida is trying to be motherly and Luz returns to get her bag, when the bats throw up two siblings and start causing more problems. Luz leaves and Ida and King agree it's for the money. Luz meets with the siblings outside the library and they use a spell scroll that seems to have some sort of lockpicking spell. As they enter, the Wailing Star passes by, and the books in the library begin to glow. They discover that when they open books, 
things related come to life. Like if a book of a birds is open, birds will start flying out, but once the book is closed, they disappear. During this, Ida has decided to read a book to the bats, trying to calm them. The siblings learn that they can modify the books with drawings. Their modifications come to life with things that are made from the magical books. Luz currently has the book that Amity was reading to the kids during that morning, Audubon the Bookmaker. And with the help of Eldrick, they make Audubon into a monster without knowing it. As Luz is dragged away by the siblings, she drops the Audubon book, leaving it open for a now monstrous Audubon to come out. The siblings go to Amity's secret highway in a romance section, bringing Luz along to help them find Amity's diary. Luz says it's a bad idea, but accidentally finds the book when she sees Amity also reads the Azora books. The siblings say that they're going to post the pages around the school to get back at Amity for being too stuck up and getting them in trouble. Luz fights against this, causing pages to fall out, showing Amity's feelings are much more complicated than seen, with Amity discovering them right after and running off in anger because it looks like Luz was reading her diary. The siblings try to convince Luz to stay and hang out, but they leave when Luz says they need to go talk to Amity. Luz catches up with her and tries to talk to Amity, but then the monster version of Audubon attacks them and takes Amity, attempting to stitch her into the book and seal her as a friend in the book. Luz tries to come to the rescue, but gets captured almost immediately. They manage to run off thanks to Luz's instinct and Amity laughs at Luz's ridiculousness. They get caught by Audubon and Amity manages to escape and Luz is almost completely sewn in before Amity attacks and gets Luz out of the book. Luz gets grabbed again and Amity uses quick thinking to use it, get a magic eraser and they fix Audubon's book. They leave in the library in the morning and Luz offers the fifth chapter of the Azora series as a peace offering. Amity takes it and she reflects, saying that she Hasn't been the kindest witch, but she will think on that. Luz returns to the Owl House, to Ida and King sleeping with the Bat Babies, and the Bat Queen returns for her kids, leaving a gold chest and a whistle, saying that Ida is owed one. Ida and King miss the babies, and Luz gives Ida a book on the empty nest syndrome. The episode ends on a joke about Hoovy. This episode was pretty dang good, and introduced some important secondary characters expanding on Luz's Amity's relationship, and gives us some good magical stories and plot implications. The highlight of the episode was of course Luz and Amity's tension, and them also seeing that they can work well together if they put their differences aside. One thing I also noticed, this may have been the earliest showing of Luz's bisexuality. Blushing up both compliments from the siblings, each one, one being male and one being female, that could be me rushing into things, but it's just what it's hinted at in my opinion. I just know later she is confirmed as such. This episode has a lot of small details and references, mainly from the library, like a Final Fantasy cameo from one of the outfits that Luz gets, a Twilight references from a book on a shelf where they find Amity's hideaway, and much more. I love how the staff are able to put such detail into these episodes and backgrounds. The fight with Audubon has a very interesting concept. We don't know what would happen if someone was fully stitched in the inn. Maybe they could have been saved as long as the Connet's magic was still there, or maybe not, but the tension of the unknown made this scene much more fun to watch. The magic, the magic Eraser was also a really smart and funny idea for fixing the plot. That it is a magic eraser was pretty funny. Audubon also kind of mirrors Luz in a way, with her just wanting a friend, or just to be Amity's friend. I think this is a clever way of doing it. The siblings are also good characters introduced because of the way they treat Amity on screen. We are able to tell a bit why Amity is so closed off, because if she were more open, the siblings could have taken advantage of that. It gives depth and explanation on some of her character traits. We also start to see Amity crack a bit from her hard shell demeanor. It is shown th through her diary that the ending with Luz and reading to kids that she has a softer side and one that is willing to open up a bit. Luz just kind of has to wiggle herself in there over time. You may have noticed that I mostly talked about the Luz plot. That's because it's the majority of the episode, but also the only thing I felt had any sticking power in the end for the plot line would have been the whistle thing given to Ida. It's a Chekhov's gun, something that can be used later if the story has is in a pinch. It does show that Ida has some motherly instincts, even though she tries to act like she doesn't have any and gives us something to work with in the future. It's not the main focus of the episode. Overall, this episode was pretty good. It gave some good amount of story and characters, some more than others, but still. The secondary plot kind of bogs it down a little bit, but it does give a good item for later use. I'm gonna give this episode a solid 8 out of 10. Good episode.
Episode 8 is a strange one. As they're working on the stand, Ida, King, and Luz decide to make a bet the body swap for the day to see who has a tougher life. The loser has to do Hootie's cleaning. The spell goes off, switching the three's bodies. Ida going into King's body, King going into Luz's body, and Luz going into Ida's body. They each go off on a small adventure each. Ida goes off and starts being babied by everyone in King's body, until eventually she is taken in by a strange cat cafe. She is set up in a crib and she is warned by a cat to escape. She dismisses the cat and is offered a costume by the owners. She tries to leave but is trapped by the staff and she locks herself in the back room. The room has a bunch of small creatures in it so brainwashed they don't know how to fend for themselves anymore. The staff break in and Ida tries to escape only to be caught and put in the costume and set out on the window. King in Luz's body attempts to become the leader of the teens by trying to show that he is a dominant force, causing trouble and leading the other teens. Basha, a character who we have seen a few times before, being a friend of Amity and the previous leader of the teens, challenges King to a race on these rat worms, and King flies off the road and into the teens hideout, angering all of them and giving chase. King eventually finding himself stuck in the cat cafe as well. Luz and Ida's body fails to listen to the advice of Ida and starts parading around the owl na lady name in glowing signs, with Ida's body also doing a bunch of magic and Luz learning how to use it to make money. She eventually gets arrested and Lilith shows up trying to interrogate who she thinks is Ida. She tries to convince that Ida to join Emperor's Coven and what Luz is saying, it is making her hopeful. She tries to brand Ida with the Coven sigil, but which you remember from episode 5 makes sure so your magic is locked and you are permanently in the Coven. Luz accidentally makes a large spell circle blowing up the side of the prison and escaping. She finds King and Ida, and Ida changes them all back as all three groups of Lilith and the guards, the teens, and the cat cafe staff all chase them down. Ida then uses the body swap spell on the people after them, with funny effect, turning Lilith into a weird dog. They escape with the dog now in Lilith's body howling at them. They all agree that they have different struggles, and Luz is eventually given the chore as a not it is declared. Now, this episode I have to admit is my least favorite so far. I have not always been a fan of body swap stories. I feel like they are very much overplayed and often kind of repetitive for Aaron and Mundane. This episode does not do much to sway my opinion. My favorite part has to be the Luz story. Her being able to use magic now is interesting to see, even if she doesn't have full control over it. The King story was kind of meh. I did kind of enjoy the hijinks the team got into on the montage. Edith's story was forgettable, and the most interesting part was the back room of the cafe, and that was only used as a set piece, and nothing was ever done with it. It did not introduce any new characters that were interesting, and didn't develop the characters that much in my opinion. Yes, they got a better understanding of each other and their struggles, which is great, but they don't do much for me as a viewer. Also, when it came to the ending, is King's body able to cast magic, or was the reversing spell stored in Albert or the staff so that Eid could reverse the spell? That wasn't made clear, and I'm unsure how it works. I feel like it would have been more interesting if, while on the run, Luz had to learn to change them back, because she's the person with the magical heart sack now. It's just an inconsistency I noticed. This episode, I will admit, has been my least favorite so far, which is a bummer, but it does make it... Does it make it bad? No, I've seen much worse episodes of television. This episode was just near the middle, a little bit under. Compared to the rest of the series, it's not that good. Compared to the other stuff I've seen, it's still relatively okay. Um, it's a matter of perspective. Hey, that's just my opinion. Someone could love this episode for all I know. But sadly, it's a 4 out of 10 for me. Near the middle of the road. Episode 9 brings us back to Hexside, with Gus and the Human Appreciation Club, showing off the artifacts of the human realm. The new kid, Matholomule, pr pronounced math Mule, shows off some fake artifacts and challenges Gus's presidency, and that he should be president. Gus says that he can bring in a real human for the club to verify these artifacts that Matholomule brought in. Gus lies and says that the ban from Luz from Hexside has been lifted to bring Luz to school. Willow criticizes Gus on him lying, and he also took down all the wanted posters, and Gus gives Luz a hood to hide her identity around the school. Edith thinks about her teaching, and thinks about how Luz might have to make her own choices, before deciding that Luz should go to school. It was hard for her, trust me. 
at the school, some enforcers have been hired since Luz's last visit, who can literally smell trouble. After running into Matholomew and showing him that Gus actually has a human, he comes with a plan to sabotage Gus after a small panic. Ida comes to Hexide and tries to convince Principal Blunt to allow Luz into the school, which he actually thinks is a good idea to have this kind of exchange student. However, Ida must fix the issues she caused while at the school for Luz to be enrolled. Luz is getting a tour and she learns about the sport, which is something to do with a griffin. We see the plant homeroom where Willow is, and we see an illusion homeroom, and that Gus is powerful enough to make an illusion of himself to go to class for him. But it seems to have a personality of its own, who Gus threatens to do what it's told. We learn that Gus has moved up a couple grades. Luz is introduced into the club, and Matholomew admits that his things were fake, and it's just that he was new and wanted to make friends. The club forgives him, and after the meeting, he shows his true colors, tattling to the enforcers who take Luz to detention. Ida starts cleaning her hex graffiti and other things she has done. Gus pulls the fire alarm to get him and Matholomew in trouble and sent to detention, which Willow sees them getting dragged away by the enforcers. We learn that detention is a flesh pit that has special pods to ingrain good behavior conditioning into the student. Ida cleans up another mess and she sees two students being friend, which gives her the will to keep going for Luz. Luz asks why Gus lied about the ban, and Gus admits that he did it because he was scared and wanted to make a place where everyone could be included. They begin a rescue and escape mission, where Gus uses his illusion magic to form an escape using clones, and him and Luz beat up the things that were in the pods to save Meth Almu from detention. Willow unlocks the detention door as Ida and Bunk reach the detention room. They have a small conversation where Bum says he will not tell the Emperor's Coven that they are there, and that Hexide is now a safe place for them both, Ida and Luz. Luz and Gus break down the door, and Bunk bans Ida and Luz. Gus steps forward, however, saying that it is his fault and is willing to take the punishment. Bunk, however, takes pity and just removes him from the president of the club. Luz is welcomed by Bunk, saying she will join class next semester. Luz is then taken on a tour by Willow and Gus after a small pep talk from Ida, saying she knows Luz will not fall for all this whole coven nonsense. The episode ends with a small slideshow of some of the Ida's permanent record, showing some of the crazy things she's done at Hexide, and starting a food fight with Abominations because someone stole Willa's lunch money. A funny little note was a person typing this up was asking why they were doing it and said they, they ate donuts for their mental health. Now this episode was pretty good. It gave us some explanation on Gus's character and expanded a great amount on Hexide school. Gus is he seen here as very smart, yet insecure. He's moved up a few grades, showing he's younger than the rest of the cast, and is striving for acceptance and unity in the Human Appreciation Club. He has also shown that he can be rather brave, jumping into the detention hole to save Matholomew, and using his magical skills to get them out of that situation, showing that he's extremely skilled in illusion magic, which makes sense why he would move up a couple grades. Luz was there because she was tricked, but shows that she is a very forgiving character for Gus lying and Matholomew being a jerk. We also see a lot of growth from Ida, and how much she has grown to care about Luz. She was willing to go through so much bull just to get Luz enrolled. She knew it would make Luz happy, so she tried her best to make it happen. Also, I got a large laugh from the graffiti saying, The mother no! was just so funny to me. The school was also fleshed out as well, including a few things like the detention process, the sport, which we learned later through text is called Grugby, and that Ida was a part of the potion strike at Hexide. As well, if we didn't notice before, Amity's siblings are on the same track as Gus, which is different than Amity's, who is on the Abomination track. So since Luz is now enrolled, I'm curious to see what Luz will be a part of, what track she'll be a part of, or even if she's required to be part of a track or not. Something to think about. This episode was largely about interpersonal tension and wrongdoings, either currently in the act of wrongdoing or trying to fix a past wrongdoing. This was a solid episode. Not extremely great, but much better than the previous. I'm easily giving it an 8 out of 10. It was real good. Oh boy, now this is an episode I have not seen yet. Let's get to work. In episode 10, we see as King tries to take over the playground, and fails. While doing so, Ida and Luz are talking about Albert, Ida's palisman, or a creature that is atop her staff that she created and is bonded to for life. While talking, Ida passes out and has one of those cursed dreams in the Grey Void. Upon waking, 
They all head home and Ida learns that Luz and the rest of the group of her friends are going to a, a rugby game. I wrote it autocorrected the rugby, dang it. After getting some hexide gear from the lost and found, they realize they missed their chance to fly the trolley to the opposing school. Luz gets the idea of using Ida's staff to fly there, during which King goes to tell his plan to take over the playground to Ida, who is supposed to be sleeping, but has turned into her cursed form, but she is still somewhat conscious, being able to realize friend from foe. Luz arrives and King hides Ida, lying to give Luz permission to use the staff. Luz and her group try to fly Albert, the staff, but because of Luz's lack of experience with the staff only flying it in straight lines, and causes a crash that damages Albert, who runs off and the group follows him, which leads them to the Bat Queen's lair. The Bat Queen gives trials to Luz to show that she truly cares about Albert and won't hurt him again, which Luz does without the help of Willow or Gus. Ian and King are conquering the playground at this time, and King realizes he doesn't have much control over Ida as he thought he did. Animal Control, which are the demon hunters now from before, which most likely means they got demoted of some kind, capture Ida and lock her away as King follows the truck hauling her. Even though Albert is ready to leave with Luz and forgive her, the Bat Queen gives one surprise final trial, and that is to face her in combat. During the fight, Luz realizes that the Bat Queen was once too a talisman, who was broken and discarded. She reveals, yes, she was one for a giant, and that she takes in hurt, unwanted, or discarded talismans to protect them. The Bat Queen strikes again, but Albert gets in the way, saying that he cares for Luz and the Bat Queen lets them go. Luz makes a promise that whenever the Bat Queen is ready or willing, Luz will help her find her truth. On the animal control truck, Ida transformed back by the help of King's cuteness, or as they call his angry squeak, and Ida escapes. At home, Luz gives Albert a band-aid, claiming that he is now part of the Boo Boo Buddies Club. Ida gets home and Albert tries to lie to Ida to cover for Luz, but Ida sees right through it, but is too tired to care, heading to bed. We pan over to Ida, where we learn that the elixir is not working as well on the curse anymore. We show a final shot of the Bat Queen feeding her young knowledge. Literally, she's feeding him book pages before going to bed. This episode was pretty good. It has a lot of world exploration, cool concept, a solid storyline, all of it. Almost every character has something to do or a good moment in this episode. The one who got the least was Willow. The only standout moment for her in my head was her mentioning her parents' staff to get the plot going. Gus has plenty of jokes and Ida and King have their own story. Each story I felt like had their own merits. Luz's story had more prevalence, but Ida and King's story was nothing bad or nothing I would turn my nose up at. King learned a lesson to not take advantage of the curse, and I think he also learned it's a bit more worrisome now that she does not go into that form. Luz learned about palismans and how Ida carved her roots from an ancient tree. The Bat Queen reveal was actually very interesting, like she is both a demon and a talisman, or she is a talisman first, but then became a demon as she gained more power. Something to learn in the future and something I'm actually excited to learn about. Wizard we'll learned that these creatures can communicate with each other without words magically through some sort of connection, which is Neat, and they can survive indefinitely without a staff, which is interesting. Can palismans be passed down, or does one always have to be made by a specific wizard or witch? Do they just go off on their own when their witch or wizard passes, or is there some sort of magical, like, pass down system? Lots to learn. I really did enjoy this episode. The story with Ida was very intriguing, and the Bat Lady story was very nice. It also had a lot of good jokes. The split joke made me laugh a few times, just the audible crack of the face Luz makes and it makes it funny to me. And Gus getting out of the webs and getting caught again was also pretty funny. The episode stepped up very well in the comedy department and compared to the last few episodes, even though it had some serious moments and a lot of funny stuff, it was still a great episode. Gus was a standout when it came to jokes from Dance With Flags, saying that the day was better than the rugby game because he came out with trauma. It was a very good episode, eight out of 10. Episode 11, I will say from the start, is a great episode. It starts off with King and Ida at the stand, and King not getting enough attention. They learn through Luz that a book fair is active, and King and Luz go to have a look around, while Ida looks for someone to pickpocket. Luz explained how she always wanted to be a writer, so much so that she had an about the author photo with her since she was seven. King questions this since she always wanted to become a witch, but she explained that in her realm that wasn't really well possible, so she wanted to become a writer. Luz and King decide to enter the book fair together and write a story. 
Lou so she can write, and King so he can have power over his fans like the author he saw at the fair did. Ida on the other page finds her sister, Lilith, getting a map to the Bloom of Eternal Youth, which she plans to find for the Emperor. Steve, the guard, asks about finding Ida to join the coven, but she says that Ida will be here when she gets back. Steve, who is now a favorite, goes off and gets paths from Lilith, which he is happy about as they walk off. Ida gets a map for herself, which we can see the ferret guy giving out the map has a full drawer of. Luz and King start brainstorming, and the way they parody self-inserts is also funny. It goes on a montage of them writing and giving parodies of common writing tropes. Ida calls Luz to the main area and tells her that she is leaving for a few days, and King takes this as a chance to redo his own writing, which kind of throws a wrench in what they have written before. Luz separates from the story, and King goes to get someone to read his story. A publisher named Pignette finds him and offers him a contract and promises him fame. King signs and says he likes Pignette's vibe. King's book gets published and is a massive success. King is surrounded by success and fans, which quickly goes to his head. Ida is traveling and hears someone following her, which turns out to be Lilith. They run into each other and Ida runs off with Lilith close behind. King invites Luz to a big party being thrown in the honor of his book, which he rejects at first but chooses to go eventually. Pinya asks King at the event how the second book is coming along, and King realizes that he can't write without Luz's help. He says it in a pretty bad way, and Luz walks away congratulating King on his success. It cuts to Ida and Lilith, who reminisce about old times as Lilith is captured and Ida saves her, saying, We may fight, but you're still my sister. They find the bloom, but they learn that it's not real and it was a trap. Luz tries to walk away, but is trapped by Pignette and his guards. King says he can't go on writing his second book, and Pignette says he knows about Luz, and he has trapped her in a shrinking box. He puts King into the box, and he says he won't let them out until they write a second book. He also shows that he controls the other writers by boxing them in as well. Luz and King come up with a plan after coming to amends. Ida and Lilith look unimpressed at the guy who tries to go on a speech. Lilith and Ida mock him because they know they are so much more powerful than him, and they get ready to beat him up. It goes back to Luz and King, who use a lake lift and the King's scarf to tear up the contract and get out of the box. They try to escape, but they are caught by the guards. The little white big-nosed gal from the first episode breaks in, who I have learned from the wiki whose name is um, Telina Noza. Haha, <laughs> very funny, very nosy. She wants King to read her book, which King declines, but Pignette agrees to do so if she will leave so that he can axe King and Luz. He reads it and almost is brought to tears, offering her a publishing deal, which allows King and Luz to escape, as well as the previously boxed writers. Ida and Lilith beat the heck out of the guy. Lilith says that she won't cart her off to the coven because she wants to give Ida a chance to make her choice on her own. Ida rejects saying that she will fight the curse on her own. They have a heartfelt goodbye and Ida flies off. Luz and King renounce the books as Ida gets home, and the typewriter ends the episode by saying, you don't want to know. Now this was a solid episode, lots of character moments, connections, and dynamic stretching. I love the dynamic between Lilith and Ida, showing that even though they are opposing sides, they still care very much about each other. Ida reminisces while running of the times that they raced to the kitchen when they were young, and then bonding over beating up the scammer. It shows that even though they irk each other, they still care very much for each other. It's a solid sibling dynamic, and as a man who has two brothers, I can relate to it. As a writer, I am currently working on a wizarding book, I relate to the whole story about King Luz. I tried to write in my youth, it was far from good, but I also learned quickly about predatory publishers, wanting to get full control and rights to the author's work through predatory contracts. This is portrayed really well in the episode, but also the process of writing is portrayed well as well. How it goes from scattered ideas to a story and acts, etc. When it comes to writing with other people, it also shows the conflicting ideas and how the struggle for what idea will become canon. King takes over, but it's shown that Luz's ideas are still prevalent in the writing. Because if not, he would not have been able to write the sequel to his on his own without Luz. The dynamic between King and Luz is stretched here, and is done well with good tension, but not a thing that may permanently scar the friendship. This is also a good study of the author's perspective on their own work. Because the show has writers, obviously, and they're able to speak through the characters, when they do... I really enjoyed it. Like, Luz called out when Crunch Time was mentioned about how it was a toxic mentality that led to burnout. You could tell that the writers were calling out through that line. It was perfect for the moment, which made it not only factual, but funny. 
The episode shows that even though Luz may be immature, she still has a lot of mature aspects about her, like how she eventually went to King's show even though she felt betrayed to congratulate him. This episode did have a bit of an animation hiccup twice. The first one was might have been intentional when Luz was showing off the book fair, her eyes looked a little crossed, but when she it made me laugh with the follow-up joke about the books being alive. The second one was when she was walking through the library, her eyes just looked way off. That might have just been me. Overall, however, this episode was great. I love the growth and dynamic between Ida and Lilith. Losing King's dilemma was well thought out and gave every character that was introduced something to do, and had lots of funny and memorable quotes, like Luz telling King not to insult shipping in front of her, and King asking why basement dwellers were in natural sunlight. Would give it a 9 out of 10. It was great. Also, Steve. We love Steve. Episode 12 is a great episode, and definitely one of my favorites. This episode starts with Luz reading about the history of Hexide, being excited about being accepted in. Ida comes in with her new influx of trash from the human realm as Luz runs off to meet with Amity to get her Azora book back. She runs to meet with Amity and gets surprised by Emra and Edric, Amity's older siblings from the previous library episode. Turns out they have been apologetic and extra nice to Amity since the library incident in episode 7. Luz says she'd like to start an Azora club at Hexide when they get become classmates. Amity is confused, explaining that there are requirements to get in normal classes, which is having two spells they have mastered, or else they end up in baby classes. However, Luz only knows the light spell. She lies and says she knows more as to not look bad in front of the three siblings, before running off to go get help from Ida. She uses Ida's pride against her, and Ida agrees to bring Luz to somewhere to train her at a, basically as a magical boot camp. While this happens, King comes in claiming he will lead the boot camp, but is rejected when Luz needs to focus. Ida brings Luz to a place called the Knee, where witches of old came to develop their magic because it was a natural magical power area. It is a dangerous place, however, having powerful predators like the Slither Beast. While monologuing, Luz almost gets hit by a fire spell, which turns out to be Amity and the twins also training up here. It shows Amity is using a training wand to learn new spells. During this conversation, Ida embarrasses Luz, but after a small talk, they come to an understanding. Ida's ways are strange, sticking moss in her nose, but it's natural magic, so I guess it's supposed to be strange. Uh, King tries to make his own boot camp with his stuffed animals and rejects Hootie's help, but sees the vegetables that Ida turned to animated earlier in the episode and comes up with a plan to make his stuffed animals real. We cut back to Ida and Luz. Ida says that the earliest witches learn from nature, and human witches need to do the same. She set Luz up at the far top of the knee, looking over the rest of the boiling isles, and tells her to think about what the island is trying to tell her. Luz gets distracted and begins to take the practice wand from the ma in the Magic 101 book that Amity tried to bring to learn new spells. During this, King pours his potion on the stuffed animals to animate them, and his first order is to get him snacks but everything is not as it seems. While the three siblings are distracted, Lou snatches the wand of the book and practices magic, being able to cast a fireball spell. Ida catches her and questions her. Luz tries to show off the magic, but the wand being nearly out of power, it causes it to malfunction, and the fireball spell goes haywire, launching into the distance and hitting the Slither Beast. The Slither Beast tries to grab Luz, but grabs Ida instead, and the three siblings find them and realize Luz took the book and the wand. The twins try to catch the beast and Amity tries to take it out, but the training wand is out of power. Luz admits that she doesn't know any more spells, and the twins are also captured by the beast as it runs off. Back to King. He chastises one of the stuffed animals who becomes hostile. Back to Amity and Luz. Amity locks up Luz to avoid her getting hurt. Luz sits down and casts light, and it shows a glyph in the sky as nature begins to teach her its in its own way of magic teaching her the Ice Glyph spell through a snowflake and learning about claiming magic is everywhere. Luz has learned her second spell and runs off to go save Ida and the others by, after escaping using her new spell, the Ice Spell. King is then thrown out of the house and Hootie agrees to help after playing hard to get. Luz finds the Slither Beast's cave and after it sticks the twins and Ida to a wall, Luz admits her faults to Ida and finds Amity, where they come up with a plan. The Slither Beast tries to season the three, and Luz distracts it and runs off with the beast as Amity learns to fire spell herself without needing the wand. All three of them are freed as Luz traps the beast with the large ice glyph, 
sending it flying. It lands on its back and tries to attack the larger group, but Ida puts it to sleep. Ida congratulates Luz on her new spell, and the twins thank Amity for being brave and helping them, in their own sibling-like way. Luz and Amity talk a little, glad that they can be in the same class, and talking about having a secret Azora book club together. Luz uses her new spell to launch her and Ida towards the house, and King and Hootie share a small moment before it's interrupted by Ida. It ends with a joke by Hootie, which actually landed extremely well. Now, this is a great episode, full of strong dynamics, in-character lessons, and a strong story. The main story of Luz was amazing, definitely one of the, my favorite main stories in the show, so far, because it causes her character to learn from her actions. She took the wand, she hurt the beast, the beast was hurt, it attacked Ida and the twins. It took Ida and the twins, Amity traps her for her safety, yada yada. Each story beat goes well with each other and flows into the next one well. The way she learns it, the new spell is also very smart. At the beginning, Ida told her that wild magic is about connecting with nature, and when Luz actually does that and does not get distracted, she's able to see the magic in the world. It shows that either nature was either trying to show her these glyphs, or the nature glyphs are always in the environment. Like, maybe in future episodes she'll learn more magic by tracing star signs as the light glyph was in the sky. This opens up a lot of new potential for Luz that doesn't have to do with the magical school. Her blooming friendship with Amity is great because they see Amity is actually making an effort to actually be friendly with Luz after her growth in the library episode. She can actually hold a strong conversation with Luz, and she actually smiles and waves when she sees Luz on the knee. Also, when it came to the plan to save everyone, Amity didn't even question Luz on the plan to our knowledge. She actively listened instead of butting heads. I don't think episode 3 Amity would have done that, and it shows great character growth. As well, the knee is a really smart idea to introduce more of the world. It is a smart idea to use certain sections of the big body as waypoints or points of interest. Like, you can imagine like the head or maybe the heart maybe pressing places in the future if, anything, if this is anything to go by. Now, I know what a lot of people may be asking by this point. I have been mainly talking about the Lou storyline. What about Kings? Well, that story isn't bad either, aside from being a bit forced. It uses something early in the episode, the potion Ida uses on her food, and uses it in a new way. It also shows that both of these groups of objects, aggression is there, with the stuffed animals attacking King and the food throwing off the cooking stuff off the cliff. The use of Hootie added some great comedy to the episode, as he hasn't been getting much spotlight aside from Hootie's hassle episode, but he was mostly controlled by magic at that time. The episode is also rather funny, the stomps of the king, Luz almost getting hit with a fireball, Luz's embarrassment and her trying to act smooth with Amity, Ida with snow in her mouth, and the final talk with King and Hootie, and Hootie's final line all made me laugh. The final line was the funniest, I can imagine Hootie's face on a shirt with that line plastered on it. I will be haunted by my actions forever. Hoot hoot! Also, I have to say the music and audio cues in this episode were completely on point. The first time Luz was at the peak with the wind effect and the soft musical tone made me feel like I was in Luz's shoes with the wondrous aspect of it. The time she was trapped in the net and she learned the ice spell, the wonderful musical cues and the, and the ending of the scene with Luz falling really fit her character. Also, I like Edith's character a lot in this episode. She actually feels like she's actively trying to teach Luz, even if it's in her own way. And actually doing things the old way first is normally a great play to learn anything, like trying to learn how to churn butter. Yeah, you can do it with a, like a whisk or something like that, but you normally would start with like a big butter churn or learning through a field trip or something. Lastly, the animation was done really well. Like the chase scene wasn't as good as the intruder chases, but was still good nonetheless. I really like the ice pillar animation when it launches the beast with it growing past Luz where you can actually see Luz's reflection in the ice. The small cues in the animation are still there, the, like Luz's smile getting wider when she gets excited, like at the end when she mentions the book club, or Edie's exaggerated expressions. It all comes out great, 9.5, so close to a perfect episode. Back after back bangers, people. This episode it starts with the entry exam. Luz getting a prep talk from Ida before showing off their magic to Principal Bump. After messing up a bit, she's accepted. We turn to Luz and Ida riding on her staff to Luz's first day at Hexside, having a cool white sleeved uniform. This means that her track has not been picked yet, but it's still a cool design. Luz makes a big deal about making a good first impression. 
They get dropped off and quickly meet with Amity, who congratulates them. Zeus makes a romance joke, and King pops out of her backpack, saying that he's going to eat all of the trash. Luz meets Willow and Gus, who Gus tries to use an illusion magic to congratulate Luz, but covering all of his bases, he accidentally shows them a sad one instead. Willow talks about the main nine covens, how the witches on the, all the banners all come from magical schools, except the, one, the three ones that are mentioned are Glandis, Sate Epiderm, and of course, Hexide. As Luz goes to pick her track, a crystal ball on the principal's desk has a news story about Glandis being attacked and leaving students and teachers without magic. Luz walks in and Principal Bump tells her about an inspection that the Epirus Coven is coming to do, hoping that the sponsor may give them money to help them fix the damage that Luz and Willow did during the school in the previous episodes. Luz shows Bump the schedule she made, but it involved her doing all the tracks, which no one does. It states in the rule book that you may only pick one of, of the nine. Luz doesn't know which one to pick and asks if there is a magical piece of clothing that could pick it for her, which leads to a sorting hat joke from Harry Potter, but in the end, Principal Bump picks for her, putting her on a potion track, the same one that Edith was in. Luz goes to her first class, but has trouble focusing as she watches from the outside as Willow on the plant track and another person on the oracle track practices, practice magic against each other. As class ends, she sees a crystal ball placed on the shelf from the oracle track, and she ends up giving in the temptation and looks at it. Principal Bump catches her and places her in the detention track, since detention is currently down, where people will not be learning magic. She tries to make a good impression by standing up for the people in the detention track, a scrawny kid, a sort of dog person, and a girl with a fishhook earring, but that got her on cleanup duty. King digs through the trash and eventually gets a tie before taking the role as a substitute teacher because he wants to be an authority figure. As she cleans, Lean sees Willow and Gus through the bars, and Luz explains what happened and thinks she is better than this, and Gus and Willow plan to break her out to make a plea to Principal Bump. The girl with the fish earring approaches Luz as the teacher sleeps, and uses chalk on the chalkboard to make a key glyph, and opens a secret passageway. The girl with the fish earring introduces herself as Viney, and thanks Luz for sticking up for them, and shows Luz the secret room of shortcuts. The other two on the detention track, who are Jarbo, the scrawny kid, and Barkus, the dog person. Apparently, Barkus is able to read auras, calling Luz's a strong and silly like a baby's laughter. Luz explores the doors a bit, seeing Amity talk to herself, and seeing how the three still learn magic through the doors, listening to the classes secretly. The witch who made this secret place is called Lord Calamity. The people on the detention track want to learn more than one kind of magic, and that's why they were placed there. Through their explanations, we learn that also, beast keeping and healing tracks are a thing. So now we got potions, illusion, plants, abominations, healing, constructions, beast keeping, and oracle. I assume the last one is something music based because of the banner near the beginning of the episode. And finally, the Emperor's Coven. We have all of them now. Bonnie says that Luz made a great first impression, and Gus and Willow try to break her out. And because of bad wording, the three think Luz thinks less of them and kick her out. Luz sadly walks off with Gus and Willow. The inspector arrives, and there is a show with the finest students to impress the inspector. The act that is shown is Amity. The inspector goes up to see what she can really do before, before transforming into a beast. Amity tries to fight it with her abomination, but it gets swallowed whole. Principal Bump and Amity try to use magic to fight it, but their magic is consumed and they collapse. We shift the king, who is teaching the students on how to steal pie from windowsills. A loud noise comes from outside, and King sees the thing that is sucking magic out of Principal Bump, and he goes back to class. Luz and the others are walking down the hallway when they spot the thing eating magic from a student. It eats Willow and Gus's magic, and Luz throws a glyph at the creature's mouth as she picks up Gus and Willow to make an escape. Apparently, the human magic of glyphs burned the creature. Luz takes them back to the detention track, who Luz shows the monster to them, begging for help. Bonnie thinks that it's a greater basilisk, which would most likely be extinct, and it's most likely the thing that sucked dry Glandis high. Luz convinces them to help, even if they might get kicked out of school. They launch a plan to take down the Basculus, having him be swipe swiped by Viney's Griffin, using a secret door to cause it to fall, and Luz slamming down onto it, onto the stage in front of Amity and Principal Bump. They use Barkus's palm reading the reader of future, and use the sandbags to crush the Basculus's chest to release all the sucked away magic. Principal Bump tries to scold them and get them in trouble, but the right thing of the do wins out in the end, seeing the truth of the situation. He allows the three detentionees to pick two tracks that they wanted, being allowed to follow what they want. <laughs> Healing and peacekeeping, plants and abominations, and 
Oracle, and Potions. Lou says she still doesn't know what she wants and still wants to learn a bit of everything, and through a magical girl-esque transformation, her sleeves now represent that, she can now learn all tracks. Only one other person wanted to learn all tracks, and that was Lord Calamity, who was shown to be a young Eda Cawthorn. King is dismissed as a teacher from Principal Bump, being chased out by a broom. This is an episode filled with cool content. This episode has a lot of cool set pieces, new characters, a cool and interesting monster, and creative storytelling. My favorite part has to be Viney, Jerbo, and Barkus. These characters have interesting designs, Viney being my favorite, interesting ideas when it comes to mixing magic, I love the idea of plant abominations, and a lot of world building when it came to the format of the school. The rigid rules set did have me ask a question, however. If you're only allowed to one track at school normally, how do people in the Emperor's Coven learn other track spells? Do they get more school for their other tracks or something? Maybe they get explained. Maybe this gets explained later. We also learned what all the tracks are finally, or at least their covens, which is good st a story stepping stone. We also see that without magic, people go into a kind of dormant state in a way. Like Gus and Willow went pretty much unconscious, but grasped as they woke up again once they got their magic, seeing Principal Bump and Amity. Maybe because the sack is connected to their heart, maybe magic might be some kind of lifeline that without it might put them in a coma or something? Or maybe the power of the basilisk just paralyzed them. More future explanation. We also see Hexide's format here, with specialized classes and students allowed to take their experiments with them, which we see when Luz tries to use the smoke bomb potion that they made in class. One thing I find interesting, however, is the glyph magic actually hurt the basilisk, like it's somehow different from normal magic and I feel like it's something that might be useful in future episodes. We also get to see more of Principal Bump, and how even though he's a stickler for the rules, he can understand when he makes mistakes and makes up for them, which we saw a little bit through the previous episode when he said that Ida and Luz had a safe place at Hexide without the effect of the Emperor's Coven. The only thing I wish the episode would have is a moment with Luz and Amity, because Principal Bump was right there next to Amity in the theater area. It's kind of weird how she just kind of disappeared during the whole speech uh, about saving the school. Overall, this episode was great. It introduced some side characters, gave us a deeper look at Hexide, and showed us a new beast. Overall, this episode was great. 9 out of 10, great work. Not bad episode at all. This episode started with King and Luz bonding, making jokes on a crystal ball call with Willow and Gus. Luz leaves her school and it shows that King has been missing Luz, climbing back onto her when she comes back when she learns that school is cancelled because of a pixie infestation. Mail comes in via Hootie, and they learn of a carnival that is happening nearby. He decides to go to scam people, and Luz and King decide to go to spend time with each other. When they get there, they run into Tibbles, the character from episode 6, who is known for scamming. It turns out he was the one who sent the invitation to Ida, apparently trying to make amends, even though Ida does not buy it. She sets up shop across from Tibbles, selling horror stories about humans. King and Luz find a prize counter, and King wants some friendship bracelets with Luz, and Luz agrees to help him win enough tickets for them. Shortly after, they run into Gus and Willow, who decide to come along with them, which King isn't really a fan of. King feels sad and left out as they start playing games, with Luz giving most of her attention to Gus and Willow. King eventually scanters off and meets with a mystic named Avioso, who is obviously Tibbles in a mustache, who gives King a spray bottle that will make his problems quote-unquote disappear. They will supposedly come back when King taps his cheeks. King contemplates using the bottle and meets up with Luz, Gus, and Willow. Luz goes to grab a snack, and when picked up, King accidentally drops the spray bottle, spraying Gus and Willow. With them gone, Luz says she's going to continue to help King with the tickets and walk off. However, Gus and Willow are gone. They just shrunk. After running from Avioso's pet, they ride on a fly to try to get Luz's attention. Either then gets arrested by the carnival's police, that being the fun police. To avoid being turned into the Emperor's Coven, she takes a job selling snacks for the carnival. After Willow drops some cotton candy on Luz's hair, or it might be gum, I'm not sure, she goes to the mirror and she goes to find a mirror and King gets the bracelets. She enters the mirror maze or the house of mirrors and has lots of cool reflections that have some nice animation before finding Honey I Shrunk the Witch and Wizard. King goes to find Luz and Luz is upset and tries to take the spray bottle to fix the shrunk friends, but the bottle loses its cap and sprays both King and Luz. Tibbles comes and takes the four to his tiny show, revealing the tapping of the cheeks only works for him, and he is now having the people bet on their survival against Shrunken Beast, being a griffin, a lion with wings, and unicorns, but even only shows one unicorn at this point. 
Luz and the others use distractions and plant magic to use the water bottle as a shield, and King comes up with a plan. He apologizes to Gus and Willow and uses the beast to climb up the cage. He then ties the bracelets together and throws them at Tibbles which makes him tap his cheek. This causes the group to regrow as well as the beast, who are not normally this small. There are also now two other unicorns who just kind of showed up. The animals go berserk for the crab apple snacks that were in the tent. Ida, who was selling the snacks, dumped them all on Tibbles for the beast to attack him. King takes the pieces of the broken friendship bracelet and gives a piece to himself, Luz, Gus, and Willow as a sign to do better. Ida takes the money that Tibbles made, and the rest decide to go spend the time together at the carnival. Ida, Luz, and King return home later to Hootie, who's been talking to a fly this entire time. Now, this was a good episode, but it was not as strong as the last Hoot, honestly. I like the carnival setting, seeing how classic games work in the Boiling Isles, like how Ski Ball was more about landing it in the machine's mouth instead of just using many holes for points, and the dark th and the dart throw being made of living material. Now that I notice it, most things in the Boiling Isles are living. Carnival games, lockers, bells, most things are alive somehow. The return of Tibbles was good, he was definitely had a stronger showing this time, using magic to his advantage. Also, as well, using the fly to fly around was a clever idea with Willow and Gus. I wish I saw more of it. The talking skull was also a good joke at the prize stand, using the and using the mirror house for a way to find the shrunken Gus and Willow was really clever. There were a few animation cues that I liked, like the mirror house and the different styles, King leaning back as he figured out what Tibbles did to them. Also, even though he, it gives me nightmares, the muscular unicorn was funny. I'm talking mostly about what I like because I don't have a whole page to say about this episode. It's fairly simple in premise. I however felt like we dealt with this character growth with King already four episodes ago in the writing episode. The plot is different and so is the lesson, but King learning a lesson over and over again is starting to get a little old for me. Like, he learned a lesson from Ida during his bet with the slug in episode 3, learning that human life is hard from Luz in episode 8, learning not to take advantage of Ida's curse in episode 10, then learning about sharing and friendship in episode 11, and getting another friendship lesson and not being jealous in episode 14. I know these were all different lessons, and I'm just getting a lot of here's what I did wrong and I'm sorry for it speeches. It could be a combination of things, or me just thinking that King's development keeps getting stunted or moved backwards, but I'm starting to make notice a pattern. It did show that the episode that King and Luz really do care deeply for each other, which is good, but there's nothing else here that has much value. Does this mean the episode bad? No, it's a pretty good episode with creative ideas, it's just not a favorite of mine or one I would often revisit 6 out of 10. Now this is an interesting turn of events. With the start of the episode with Amity and her friends, one of them having a birthday party and giving out invites. We see Willow and Luz, with one of the girls, who I believe is called Basha, says that anyone who is a friend with Willow ruins their social, social status. One kid fight- Kid fight? Kid fight! In an intro later, we are at the lockers of Luz and Willow talking about the upcoming memory magic class. Amity, Basha, and Sakura, Sakura, I don't know how to pronounce that, walk by, making fun of Willow, and ask Amity about their previous friendship with Willow, which is a nod back to Howdy's moving hassle. And Amity says the Blight family only associate with a select few, and drops this bomb of a line. Keep annoying me though, I'm happy to select fewer. Damn! We then move on to memory class, where people can pluck out their own memories in Polaroid type pictures. Those with strong emotional value are more clear, and if you damage the memories, you damage the actual memories of the person, which is extremely dangerous for teenagers, but hey, magic school. Willow's plucked out memories start coming through, Willow's odd hair day, two with her dads, and yes, I say dads, keep up, and her feeding a snake thing with horns, and one with her and Amity. Willow turns the picture around to ignore it, saying out of sight, out of mind. Lou stops Willow and asks if she doesn't have all the information, she can't make them friends again using a ruse or a plan. Willow says she doesn't want that. As Willow leaves, Lou turns the picture around, and thinking she outsmarted Willow's wording. Amity and Basha pass the class, and Amity sees the photo of her and Willow, and closes the door behind her so that she can remove the memory and not be associated. She burns herself out of the memory, however it reignites and starts lighting up her other memories. As well, we can see Willow is feeling the effects of her memories being burned, being unreasonably hot. Her eyes then kind of glaze over and she forgets who Gus and Luz are. Luz puts the pieces together and they run to the memory classroom, finding Amity trying to put out the fire she started. Willow collapses and Gus, Luz, and Amity bring her back to the Owl House. We see the effects of Willow losing her memories, her even forgetting how to sit down and trying to peel King like an orange. 
Ida having to put her Willow to sleep. Ida says how dire the situation is, but she's willing to send two people Max into Willow's head to fix everything. Louis convinces Amity to come along because she is the one who caused it and Gus would not be able to focus. They are given a bell to return and warned about the inner Willow who might help them, before they are sent in. The inner part of Willow's mind is a forest of lined up trees with memories and large frames in holes of the trees. Luz touches one of the portraits and finds out they are portals to memories. The first one they go through is a memory of Willow and Amity building a fort to play hooky from their swimming class. They fix the fort, which fixed the memory. Luz was about to go into the memory that Amity originally burned, but with fear in her eyes, Amity distracts Luz with a different memory. Then a large purple fire st foot stomps down. Gus is looking for someone to interview like he was at the lunchroom, and Ida and King both step up to the plate, but Gus says that one of them will have to impress him for him to choose them. Amity and Luz go on a fixing spree, fixing memories one at a time. Amity admits that she messed up big time, and Luz consoles her and boosts her up. Amity sees the fire thing behind Luz, but when Luz turns around, it's not there, making Luz think that Amity just doesn't want to talk about it. They go to another memory full of eggs, as we cut back to King, Ida, and Gus. Gus starts to ask scattershot questions, it kind of scares Ida. Amity and Luz get to the final memory. Amity wants to leave the final memory burnt, but Luz won't go for that, causing a small outburst from Amity. During said outburst, something smells like burning, and they turn around and see all the memories' groves on fire. They see the fire monster who attacks them, and goes into memories and burns them from the inside. Amity tells Luz during the bell to get them out, but Ida is distracted, trying to impress Gus, that she doesn't hear it. Luz compares the photos being burnt and the common factor is that the target is Amity. Luz leads them back to the fort memory, drawing an ice glyph on the sand to make a fire beast fall into the water. What comes out is a still embering willow, the inner willow. They try to figure out why it's burning everything with Amity in it and it throws Amity into the portrait of her and willow that Amity originally burned. Luz is thrown in there as well because inner willow knows that Luz is curious. We see the friendship breakup between Willow and Amity, which also led to years of bullying that Willow faced. You know, Willow says that she can erase all the pain because out of sight, out of mind. We end up seeing a bit of Amity's memories and why she made that choice to drop Willow. It wasn't her choice, it was her parents. And if Amity didn't drop Willow, they would, and stop, Willow from getting into Hexide. Amity was only allowed to befriend those who her parents picked out. Amity apologizes for everything and promises for the bullying to stop. Anna Willow accepts this apology and Luz and Amity finish the memory construction. The grove is now back at full swing, looking beautiful, all memories fixed. They see the inner child Willow and the normal inner Willow walk into the woods as Amity waves goodbye, and they return back to the normal realm. Ida and King were doing a lot to be interviewed, but in the end Gus decides to interview Hootie. Willow awakens and remembers everything, including the memories of inner Willow. Amity tries to sneak away, but Willow stops her, saying that they may not be friends yet, but it's a good start. It ends with Gus and Hootie trying to do an interview, but it goes poorly, and Amity tossing out Sakura's birthday invitation. Scaras. Scara. That's how you pronounce it. Yes! This, again, was a great episode. The idea of memory class is awesome and definitely a cool way to use magic. Getting more background on Willow is great. Her being now my second favorite character. We get to see her parents and some things to do with her that made her the person she is today. We get to see her relationship with Amity that was only teased in past episodes and the toll what the bullying really did to her. The inner Willow finally be willing to burn it all the pain away. It finally snapped or finally had the tools to do so. Amity burning the memories is in character. She is slowly becoming a more caring person but still has hiccups which is completely normal and believable. Amity cares deeply for her position as a blight which can be also see comes from the strictness of her parents. They are also high ups, people who are high up in society, upper class. They can definitely have an effect on someone, whether it be the stress of living up to expectations or trying to hide previous faults and the anxiety of past mistakes, all of which we see in this episode through Amity. It also shows that Amity is much more of a faceted character with many angles. This also goes for Willow, who has mostly been a, s a person with great intentions and can be a small bit chaotic. However, we could see the side she hides, the pain she feels, the strife she hides, the struggle she has faced being a late bloomer. The idea of the memory grove is brilliant, I might use it in a D&D campaign in the future, because it fits Willow's character being on the plant track and being very attuned with plants. 
I would imagine each person may be slightly different, like I can imagine Amity's being porcelain halls with portraits hanging on the walls, or Gus being full of illusions and transparent blue things that hold his memories. I don't know if it will ever be revisited, but if it does, I would love to see another point of view. However, I would say the inner Willow was perfectly done. It held all the anger and pain Willow would normally hid, so it would make sense that she would. this would be the final straw to make her snap. It is a being of emotions. All emotions, negative and positive. It would make sense why she would try to erase all the pain. It would be too much. With Amity's help, however, she learns that even the toughest emotions can be learned from, allowing Willow to keep the good and bad memories. It's great growth for an offset of a character we already know, with understandable motivations. As well, the growth between Amity and Luz in this episode was still there, them getting a bit closer and understanding each other throughout this adventure. We also see a bit of Amity blushing again, whether it's from her crush or embarrassment we don't know yet, but it happens when Luz talks her up and when Luz hugs her thinking that they dealt with the currently on fire inner Willow. I didn't mention it too much during the episode 13, the one with the basilisk running rampant through the school. Amity has a small scene of her talking to herself that vaguely is about Luz saying, so you two go to the same school now, it doesn't change anything. This could be a hint to the friendship, a crush, or something else, or like Luz causing trouble where she now goes to school, but... Knowing that I know of the show from small spoilers and memes and comics, I see it as hints to the inevitable relationship between the two. Yes, there are gays in the Owl House now with two dads of Willow if it wasn't obvious enough. If you don't like it, you can go sit on the Crybaby Twitter bench or even worse, the Denny bench for all those who are truly deranged. Now back on topic. I really like the dynamic of all the characters, and the episode is great base for more growth between the two with their previous rough history. It also doesn't make anyone a full-out villain. Yes, Amity burned the memories, but she has reasoning and pressure to do so. Does it make it right? No! But there is a reason for it, and her reason for her actions. She was also actively trying to save the rest of the memories, only wanting to get rid of one specific one. Again, not good, but understandable when you look through her point of view, as we learn later in the episode. Lastly, on the story front, I like how it doesn't do the normal kids cartoon of everything will be hunky-dory at the end, with Willow and Am with Willow and Amity being the best friends again, they have to grow that burned bridge back, which will take time. It's a real mature way to look at the situation, and I love it. Now onto the jokes. There are some pretty good ones in here, mostly coming from Luz or Gus. Willow attempts to peel King made me laugh pretty good, though. Also, I think now it's canon that Luz either had a memory pulled or she just keeps old pictures of herself in her pockets to make comparisons or to use for later use that we don't know of which is actually pretty funny, because she did it with the Arthur photo in the previous episode, and now the old picture of her with hairstyle. Luz's I'm gonna stick my face in the delivery was great, and how Amity was able to play on Luz's want for teen drama, and love is a perfect punchline for Luz to search for a memory. The roller coaster punchline was also funny, and so was the egg memory. My favorite joke, however, was the split-second joke where they got tossed into the original burned memory. Amity was lightly tossed in, she bounced off the bed and was fine, while Luz was freaking yeeted across the room head first with an immense force and a crash. However, Luz just walks back over like it was nothing. Really made me chuckle. Now, the side story with Gus eating King wasn't bad, and it showed how really eccentric or immature Gus is. He's younger than the rest of the cast, so the stress he's under may make him make strange decisions, like almost going to necromancy to get someone to interview, or eventually choosing Hootie. As you can tell, I have a lot to say about this episode, and it's because there was a lot to unpack. This episode was amazing, and as I wrote about it, I realized I liked it even more than I originally did watching it. Originally, I was going to give it a 9, but I think I'm going to give it a 9.5 out of 10. Great episode with a lot going on. Would happily watch it again. I was looking forward to this episode, and I was far from disappointed. This episode starts off with King on the couch with Luz learning a new spell in the same way she learned on the mountain, by looking at nature. She learned the plant growth spell. As well, the door to the human realm is open, allowing a charger and some Wi-Fi to come through. This allows King to watch cat videos, and Luz regrets teaching King about the internet. Luz gets a text from her mom saying how, asking how camp is going and gives her some affection, and I had to look up the Spanish word, don't judge me, and Luz has trouble responding, but eventually does with a thumbs up. Turns out she's been having trouble talking to her mom because she's lying about being on the Boying Isles. Hootie tells Luz it's time for school and Willow and Gus are waiting outside for her who are uncomfortable by Hootie. People at the school are setting up for a special event and Luz is about to be lore dumped, but paramedics rush in and say someone is sick and there is only one treatment. The guy asks Scar of the prom and with an actual heart and she says yes. Luz understands that it's a strange form of prom and thinks that she could be the Grom Queen, but is stated that's not something to aspire to. Amity comes bolting around the corner and runs into Luz, aggressive at first until she realizes it's Luz and the others, and calms down. 
Luz picks up a pink slip of paper that Amity dropped and Amity snatches it back because it's private. The intercom comes on and announces this year's Grom Queen, which is Amity and who Luz tries to congratulate, but she runs off in shock. The auditorium is being prepared for the event, with the Snaggleback from Episode 4 returning as the Disco Ball. Luz comes in to check it out and presses a button that shows an armory of weapons and a large pit in the floor. Confused, Amity comes down to the bleachers and explains that Grom is not like a normal dance. It is meant as a yearly takeout of a beast called Gromothless the Fearbringer that lives under the school that a student must take out or else it will ravage the town. It reads minds and shape shifts into the opponent's worst fear, and Amity's fear is apparently embarrassing. Luz returns home to avoid Snaggle back vomit and finds Ida trying to suit up to be a chaperone with Grom. As well, apparently Gus is going to be uh, commentating on the Grom fight and King is invited to be his co-host. Luz states she wishes to take her place, but Ida and King laugh that off, saying she's not strong enough yet. When Luz leaves with a spider on the back of her hair, Ida and King talk and Ida says she doesn't think Luz understands what facing your greatest fear is yet. Luz goes into the forest to blow off steam and she hears footsteps and attacks. Turns out it was Amity, and Amity says Bump rejected her decision against being queen, so she either has to find a replacement or she's stuck as queen. Luz offers herself up and finally deals with the spider in comedic fashion. Luz begins to look through outfits in an otter suit before getting a text from her mom, again responding with an emoji rather than an actual text. With an interruption from Hootie, Amity comes to train her and face her fears. Amity beats the crap out of Hootie because he keeps touching her in, and Luz trains with Amity, and her siblings begins. Luz makes a list of fears, and the twins use illusion magic to, for Luz to face them. It turns out that things made her more uncomfortable than afraid. Luz says she's afraid that Ida will see her as too weak and small for the Grom fight, so they make a large Ida, and Ida finds out what they are doing. They run out of training time and leave to get ready. Cut to the Grom party where everyone is in new outfits. We see a lot of returning background characters, and Willow is doing stuff like her plant magic to make massages for the people at the party. We see Skara and her date, Mathalamu dancing with the student we saw dueling with Willow in the detention episode, and Ida waiting around to save Luz. Gus starts his announcements, and for, for such a strange little guy, he is really working the crowd. Ida warns King about teenagers that they will boo anything and ridicule can last a lifetime. We then change shot to Amity who is waiting by the door with her pink slip and Lou shows up with a mix between a dress and a suit with boots on. Amity compliments her by saying they look both look nice and strange. They have a bit of back and forth, which is nice, before Gus introduces Luz. The floor splits and everyone prepares for Grom, the fight, not the dance. Luz picks up the, a mace and places an ice glyph on it, which I have to admit is smart and Grom starts the stuff that made her uncomfortable, like the cats with human bodies and a weird text guy who's trying to debate her. She takes him out and Gus introduces King, who gets stage fright and his boot off. Gus follows him and then we're back to Luz, who is taking out all of Grom's illusions well. And it finally probes deep in Luz's mind to find out what she is truly afraid of. It turns into the human realm door and brings out Luz's mom, who scolds her for not being at camp and lying to her. Gus comes out to the auditorium and finds King and gives him a pep talk on how to play the crowd. Luz actually gets afraid and runs off, passing Gus and King as Grom chases after her. King uses the microphone and what Gus just taught him to rally the crowd and follow the escaped Grom. Ida and Amity both give a knowing nod and go to help Luz. Grom chases Luz to the cliff and Ida flies in and hits Grom to distract it. Amity comes out of the woods and gets between Luz and Grom and gets snatched up in her fear red. It turns out and turns into a humanoid shape, taking the slip of paper Amity was carrying in her pocket and rips it up in two. Luz reads it and it turns out it was a note asking something to Grom. Her fear was rejection. Luz says she'll go to Grom with Amity and this gives them both a resolve to fight Grom and it is a beautiful mix of dance and magic eventually using one of the plant glyphs from the first minute of the episode to force feed it to Grom using one of Amity's abomination, causing a large pink leaf tree to sprout. Grom is defeated, and now the two Grom Greens gain their crowns. Luz asks Amity who they wanted to ask out, but Amity says it doesn't matter, and now tosses her half of the note, showing that it was Luz after all. King announces their victory, and the Grom crowd comes out and lifts the two girls up and King in celebration. They return to the Owl House, and Ida congratulates Luz, who just goes up to bed. She sits on the windowsill looking over the ocean, getting another text from her mom, this time being able to actually text her back in a heartwarming way. She says that once a day she'll tell mom all about this. The strange thing is, her mother says she loves receiving her letters, which Luz thinks is a weird way to refer to text. But we see her mom's point of view, and she is receiving actual letters signed by Luz. However, the first time it's spelled with an S instead of a Z. The episode ends on a nice photo show of Fort Grom, and a snaggleback begging to be let down in the darkness. Now this episode was peak Owl House. 
It had drama, character growth, actual things from the beginning of the episode leading to the bigger points in the episode, really funny jokes, amazing animation, and on-point music and great vocal delivery. I don't know where to start. We'll start with the story. It was very well done, with both A and B story mending into each other seamlessly. King and Gus actually have a very good dynamic, Gus being young but charismatic, and King actually learning a skill and doing good at it. The A-plot was amazing. It was a perfect mix of seriousness and comedy. Some shows have problems keeping that balance, where it's too serious, one or too many jokes make it seem like they can't take it seriously, because there's just someone bumming around in a serious situation not taking it seriously. While on the other hand, if it's just straight a comedic episode, putting too much seriousness in it feels forced and tugging the episode or series in a different direction. The Owl House finds a good balance in most episodes, and especially in this one. The plot of Amity and Luz working together in different ways to face Grom was great. Luz taking the mantle from Amity so she wouldn't have to face her fear, Amity taking up responsibility to train Luz, Luz facing her fear and failing, Amity coming to save Luz, and eventually both of them work together to beat Grom. It's a unity dynamic that I really enjoy. It's a back and forth, not just one character doing all the legwork. If Amity or Luz was not in this episode, or had a different personality, it would not have worked. If episode 3 Amity was in here, it would not have worked. If the character growth and the connection between both Luz and Amity, that makes sense this episode works the way it does. The other characters aren't dead weight either, almost every character has something to do with Hexide, or something to do, aside from, aside from some teachers. I do wish I saw the detention trio, but that's me, I like those characters and I would have made sense for them most likely not wanting to go to Grom. It would be, it would be in character. Willa makes corsages, Gus, King, and Bump announce, Ida is on the sidelines stressed waiting for something bad to happen, background students are seen together in unseen pairs, showing them that they either threw people together or they have some actual weight behind these pairings. I'd like to know more in the future. As well as the alternate costumes all fit very well with each of the characters, Luz's is being scattered a bit, which also makes sense with their personality. Amity's is very plain, just like her siblings. While they chose to wear yellow, she went for more of her abomination colors. Willow's is nice and has earth tones, while Gus's is the color of his illusions. All of these designs are great and go along with the characters in some way. The underlying pressure of what Luz could say to her mom was there throughout the whole episode, and the stress about it was palpable. I'm sure most of people can relate to having trouble communicating with their parents. It's a common struggle, and it was building to be her fear, and it was well done and understandable from Luz's perspective. She even knew it wasn't her mom, but that's not what scared her. It was the idea of upsetting her mom that was scaring her, and she was afraid of doing it without Grom even being there. As well, Amity's struggle in the episode was understandable, and that being a fear for a lot of teenagers. Rejection, myself included, when I was a teenager like seven or six years ago. It was sweet to see Luz offer herself to go with Amity so she wouldn't feel alone. The fight together with Grom was also a good message of how fears aren't as scary if you don't face them alone. Lastly, there is a big plot hook that I'm excited to see coming. That is the letters. Why, her mom is getting physical letters from a Luz at camp. But Luz isn't at camp, she's in the aisle, so who is sending the letters? We talked about the story and design, so let's talk about the animation and who oh boy! This is one of the best. This one is a beast. Like, episode 4 is, it had one large section of extremely well done animation. It is chase scene in episode 4. Well, this episode had Luz and Amity's dance. It was less than 30 just under 30 seconds, but boy what a 30 seconds it was. I can just imagine they must have had some type of base for the moves, like pictures or actual dancers doing something because of how smoothly and well done it was animated. The moves were actually had weight, and you could tell that Amity was the lighter person than Luz, and Luz being the one doing the swinging, and Amity be the one thrown around and spun. The only part of that that was different was the dip they used to place the glyph on the Abomination's head, but that wasn't a bad thing. Lastly, the animation on their clothes was great, showing that how the wind kind of folds around them as the tree grows in the way they're moving during the dance. The rest of the animation of the episode isn't to sneer up either. Most of the animation at Grom and the Grom monster itself were great, lighting and shading and backgrounds, then Grom itself changing shape gave a great sense of volume that the creature had. Its animation of shifting between forms is great, still giving that feeling of mass while playing up its unsure form. Next, that music was really well done, cued to great times, and never felt like it overstayed. It was used in smart moments like the dance scene or when the fears were brought into reality. The talk between Luz and Amity under the light spell in the forest was also very nice and added to the scene, with a quick cut for a joke at the end. Speaking of jokes, as I said, this episode has a perfect mix of comedy and story. The spider joke actually made me laugh out loud, and so did the blithe beating heart that was used to ask someone to Grom. If I did that, I'm pretty sure I would be arrested and get a restraining order placed upon me. The otter suit was also a funny joke, with Luz's exaggerated expression, and Hooting getting freaking bodied by Amity was a great punchline. Literally. 
The videos were great too. Love the guy on the phone who wanted the debate. Neckbeards on Twitter's be like that. Finally, for the fears, the lactose was funny and even brought up as a later joke. Another joke I like that was actually used for a later bit of character bonding was when Luz asked Amity if she was going soft on her. Shows that they understand Amity a bit and they can actually be comfortable enough to make these kind of jokes. Lastly, this episode is, I believe, kind of confirms that Amity has a crush on Luz or at least wants to get closer to Luz. Her biggest fear at the time was being rejected by her and she was actually going to ask Luz to Grom if she got up the nerve. So if Luz isn't crushing yet, Amity sure is. Also, Aaron Hansen, freaking Eagle Raptor, played the Snaggleback and one of the other voices. Good to see him. And apparently he was in episode 4 in the Snaggleback and I just missed it. I'm sorry, Aaron. Please forgive me. You did a great job. This episode was an amazing episode of the show. Nothing was seemingly left on the cutting board, and I have no complaints about it. It had a great pace, great story, emotional moments, splendid music, and so much more. If you were to watch one episode of The Owl House thus far, from what I have seen, and you wanted to get someone into the show, I would recommend this one. Two and a half pages of me ranting about this episode, and I am done with it. The first 10 out of 10 of the show. Truly great. Rugby. This episode starts off with a montage of Basha, the three-eyed friend of Amity that has been mostly a background character up until this point. She actually is the captain of the Grugby team, the sport of this magical realm, and its season has just started. Her and her team walk into school expecting praise, but the one who would normally grovel at them are being impressed by Willow and her advanced plants magic. Basha walks and tries to pick on Willow, but Amity walks up saying she used to be like Basha but she grew up and asked Basha when she would. Cut to the intro and we see Luz being dropped off at school and Ida reminiscing about her time playing rugby, being the star player. Luz realizes she can't argue with Ida's cheating and crazy and heads to class. Ida decided to go down memory lane at home. While distracted, Willow is called to answer her own question but gets it right and support for Willow is given. It seems the situ- It seems since the- situation with Amity, she's become more confident, which has made her more popular. Basha takes Willow's hair clip, making fun of her, thinking she's popular. Lou stands up for her, and Gus takes the clip back. Basha then dumps Willow's bag on them, and when the teacher asks, he just plays in the Basha status. She then follows the crew around the entire day to pick on them. They eventually see Amity, though. Luz comes up and asks for help, and with a, sp a split-second thought, Amity agrees to help, before even asking what she just agreed to. Amity says that Amity says that Basha only speaks in grugly terms, and that gives Luz an idea while having a silly smile. Basha dumps garbage on Willow before Luz challenges Basha on Willow's behalf to a grudge be match. We go back to Ida, who's looking through her old scrapbook and looking at a picture of herself. Talking to King, she shows her box of cheats. Then suddenly, Hootie opens the door saying they have a guest and a special friend they found in the forest before dropping Lilith on the floor. Lilith says she's here to bring Ida in, but Ida is not taking her seriously. Lila snatches the scrapbook, showing that the picture she's been showing around is folded, showing Lila's side of the picture with a bigger trophy than Ida's. Ida challenges Lilith to a rugby match, and if Lilith loses, she leaves, but if she wins, Ida will join the coven. Back to Luz. They talk about the terms of the match. If Luz wins, they leave Willow alone and the rest. But if Basha wins, Willow's group becomes their water gophers, which I assume is water boys, and they become their target for targets for target practice. Luz uses stuff that she's learned from movies and she thinks they can win using a small speech. Willow and Gus are in, but when they ask Amity, With you? <laughs> Running around in cute uniforms? <laughs> I gotta go! Yeah, her crush is definitely getting worse. <laughs> they get into the Grugby field and Luz learns what Grubbly Grubbly. They, they get to the Grugby field and learn and Luz learns what Grugby actually is, which is basically magic basketball. They begin they have a montage and begin the practice. Luz gets a bit too carried away and uses a thorn vault, which she learned from the Azora movie, and Gus flags and Willow's hairpin breaks. Willow seems to have lost hope and leaves to help Gus fix its flags. Ida and Lilith begin their match, which no magic is involved. As well, they learn that even though Ida is a star player, Lilith was the team captain. Their match begins, and we cut back to Luz, fixing the hair clip with her band-aid. Amity comes to talk to Luz, and Amity admits she used to be the team captain before Basha. She left the team after she used the Thorn Vault to win a match instead of the safer option, hurting her teammates. Luz scares Amity by being too close as they were telling the story, and Basha's team shows up. She gives Amity the repaired hair clip and goes to face Basha. Luz forfeits and offers to take Willow's place and whatever Basha needs. She begins to launch fire grugly ball. Grugly. She begins to launch fire grugby balls at Luz, and Amity goes to get help. 
she makes it her way to the plant classroom and talks to Gus and Willow, complimenting Luz before taking it back, you know, flustered girl emotions, before eventually convincing them to help Luz. We go back to Ada and Lilith and it's a tie game. Ada goes for a box of tricks, but Luz, trying to be helpful, cleaned it out thinking it was a lunchbox. So Ada needs to win fair and square. Ada wins by jumping off a hoodie, scoring the final point. Lilith can't go back after handed, so out of pity, or caring for her sister, she gives Lilith her ring, telling her to tell the coven that she, the owl lady put up a fight. Lilith leaves, saying she will be back with help, and Nita says she will be waiting. We cut back to Luz, who is basically running for her life. Willow comes to save Luz, and the game is back on. They however need three players, and Gus doesn't volunteer, so Amity steps up to the plate on her own. Basha says Amity just ruined her social life, but Amity disagrees, saying she just made it better. This angers Basha, and the game is on. The game starts Will using plant magic and Amity using abominations to help Luz score goals or scoring goals by themselves. Luz is actually friendly with the other team, which they seem to appreciate except for Basha. Basha tries to score with a flaming ball, but Luz uses an ice glyph, which cools it down enough for her to catch it, and she learns to fire glyph through this. Another tool for Luz. Another goal, and it's all tied up. With Luz's magic, they decide to go for the Thorn Bolt. Willow goes on it and scoring the goal, however when they think that they won, the score of the opposing team goes from 9 to 999. It turns out if you get this golden bug thing, you automatically win. Luz criticizes the situation, saying what's the point of playing the game if you could just search for that instead. Bosch's team goes to Willow, saying that they had a blast and offer her to join the team, but Willow turns it down. They see that Amity hurt her leg, and Luz offers her the carrier if it really hurts. Crush stuttering happens, and Luz lifts up Amity. They have another montage of them just playing the game for fun, messing with the scoreboard, having tea, and Amity is joined in when she has a cast on her leg. Now this was a good episode, hard to live up to the last, but it was still a good one nonetheless. This episode had a lot of comedy and serious moments, and a good B-plot with Ida and Lilith, and the character and social developments for Amity. Speaking of Amity, her crush is obviously worse, and is shown off in funny ways, like her getting flustered when Luz is too close, or ranting with the Gus and Willow, having to correct herself when she says something she likes about Luz. It's obviously she's trying to hide it, and Willow's development is also great. It's nice to see she's getting more popular because people have been picking on her less. You know the saying of having space to bloom? It's kind of that kind of situation. As well, it makes sense that Willow would get kind of frustrated with Luz's plots and schemes, and in her situationally toned deafness. She does this in the rugby stadium, and it was bound to happen. Even if Luz does have good intention, it usually leads to trouble or writing a check she doesn't know if she can cash. It's good to call it out in character so it can be something Luz can work on. Gus is also great in this episode as a supporting role with jokes and some fun things with solutions. Amity being part of the Grugby team also makes sense, pulling towards her high ties with Skara and Basha, both being on the team as well. Many of these higher ups are also social ups, and not just being because of riches, but because of their talent in magic and sports. Like a guy who has rich parents, but whose parents are part of the school board and he's also a varsity football team member. One does not lead to the other, but it, it sure does happen a lot. These people build up status like building blocks, so they have something to fall back on socially. We haven't seen Basha being great with magic aside from lifting stuff with class in the Grugby field, so maybe Grugby is really her thing more than magic? Who knows? It's nice to explore these background characters more so that they can be used more in future episodes more succinctly. I also like how Lilith was introduced as well, being constricted by Hootie and dropped on the floor. She's likely getting a bit sloppy when it comes to fighting Ida, and it's slightly more desperate than before because because this time she can't come back after handed. Next to jokes, even though that they were spread out, they were pretty good. The ghost part at the beginning was funny, the door violently slamming on the guy who yells Go Willow, the Luz pulling the Ricky music which is an off obviously a Rocky parody, and Hootie messing with Ida and Lilith's game were all great. The animation, while not spectacular as the previous episode, was still pretty good, even during the Grugby games with creative uses of magic. Overall, this episode was pretty good. I would watch it again. It may not be Grom level episode, but it was still pretty good. 8.5 out of 10. Wow. Sports. Now this episode actually made me tear up. I'm man enough to say it. It does not start that way though. This episode starts off with a shot of Emperor Bellus's castle. Lilith standing on the outside and walking in before talking to a character we'll call Kiki, who is asking about the Owl Lady. Lilith assures that Ida will be captured and plans an assault. This assault starts, thinking that they're in the clear because Hootie's asleep. He wakes up, however, and bodies the whole squad and Lilith by himself. While this is going on, Ida is making some magic skeddy, which is just magical cloth that repels magic called Witch's Bowl. Luz wants a cloak made out of it, but right now Ida says she needs to help deal with the Emperor's Coven, who has been ramping up their attacks lately. 
Edith's curse acts up, and Luz and King have to make her drink many, 12, bottles of elixirs just to turn her back. While in the curse, she has the same dream about the person at the door. Luz is, figures out the curse is getting worse, and Edith says as long as she doesn't overuse her magic, she'll be fine. And gets hugs from Edith before being sent to school. Edith decides to do something nice for Luz using the witch's wall, because she's grown a great appreciation for Luz. Luz passes the Coven Scouts being restrained by Hootie and having a tea party, and passes Lilith, who gets a call being summoned by Bellos. Turns out today is a field trip to Bellos' castle, how quaint, where many relics are found, like a plant gauntlet, or an orb to see the path to, to your best self, and a hat that can cure diseases and curses. This has Luz go on a plan, and on the way to the castle, she hides the plan from Willow and Gus. Turns out Amity couldn't make it to the trip because of her leg, which made her mad. We learn that according to lore, Bellos is the strongest witch to ever live, and made his castle as a sign of unity. Apparently he can even talk to the titan of this land that it was built on. Kiki is their tour guide, and is called the Emperor's assistant. We then learn some history about the Isles, and just like in the history class from the last episode, we hear that 50 years ago magic was wild, and witches and demons did whatever they pleased, and had access to corrupt knowledge. Then Bellos took the throne and taught witches how to use their magic properly. They head to the relic room and Luz gets her eyes on the healing hat but is pulled away by her friends to continue the tour. Lilith makes her way to the castle. She passes them on her way to Bellos and Luz follows, splitting from the group. Luz gets to see inside the throne room. Lilith bows before Bellos, a large beating heart surrounded by pipes and machinery behind his throne. There are coven members standing alongside the large rug towards the throne with a man with an owl-like mask beside the Emperor. He is hunched over, breathing heavily, before taking what looks like a palisman, you know, one of those creatures on top of the staffs, and drinks the magic out of it through the eyes of his mask, returning to seemingly normal. Luz is visibly disgusted and horrified and runs off. He asks about the Owl Lady Hunt, and gives her time that she asks for. He will give her till twilight that day to get Ida, and if so, he will heal the curse and have her join the coven. However, if she fails, she will be removed from the coven and become a covenless witch. From the friends given, we can see that that's not pretty. As he says this, he grips his chair and you can hear the heart in the room beat faster. She says that she understands and will not fail before leaving the heartbeat returning to normal. Ida is making a cape slash cloak for Luz as a gift, and King knocks down a picture of Luz, Ida reminiscing about how much things have changed since Luz has arrived, and believes that Luz is growing up. Luz is now hiding, and sees the class leaving the castle from a high up window and she sees... herself? Turns out Gus and Willow found her plans and went to help her. They set up a heist using all their combined magic to set up the heist. Hiding in bushes, using illusions, using fire magic to melt bars, the works. They get to the relic room and Luz grabs the hat and filling the magic. And Gus grabs the orb to hear his path, and he hears that he's always in best self which makes him cry. Willow tries on the glove and puts it back, saying she just wanted to try it. It's cute. Um, they hear a voice saying that they will know if the hat is gone, and before a lockdown starts, Willow uses the glove to break the metal door, and Lilith catches wind as she is pondering what she could use as leverage against Ida to get her to come to the castle. She sees Ida's human pet, and sees it as a ticket to what Ida cares about. She takes out Gus and Willow, who are trying to use the magical artifacts to fight her, before sending them off on her staff as a message to Ida. That Luz is captured, and if she wants her back, that she has to come to the castle. Ida gets finished with her cloak and ties a bow to it, as King comes out with a cake he made, which Ida puts him inside. Who lets him know that someone is coming, and they assume it's Luz. But when Ida answers the door, it's Willow and Gus with Lilith's staff floating menacingly behind him. Twilight comes. Lilith is on the bridge of the castle, Bell is watching from above. Ida teleports in, extremely angered, and launches Lilith's staff into the castle without even a word. They fire for a few seconds. More Ida just shooting magic before Luz is revealed in a bubble, saying that she will get Luz back if she just joins the coven. Lilith pleads because Bellos can heal the curse. Ida doesn't believe it, thinking Bellos only wants to control her. Magic starts flying, Ida stating because she is wild that she had to work harder and more fight ensues. It's obvious that Ida is superior, not only fighting Lilith but also stopping Luz from getting hurt at the same time, while also being cursed, while Lilith can barely keep up. Lilith keeps, up, keeps using Luz as a distraction or shield, and, and Ida calls her a coward for this, and how it's sad that Lilith cannot even keep up with her at her worst, while Ida's gemstone in her chest is getting more black as the curse is getting closer and closer to consuming her. Ida fires magic while Lilith is behind the shield, Luz finding a way to pop her bubble. 
Lilith says she's had to work smarter than Ida before a bombshell is dropped. You always thought you were better than me, that I could never beat you in anything. I am better than you. Then why were you so easy to curse? Ida's memory is cleared and she sees her sister in, as a shadowy figure before in that light room. Lilith tries to backstep, saying she can fix it, but Ida rushes her, sending her into the castle wall. Luz tries to stop her from overusing her magic and calm her down, but Lilith uses Luz as leverage, throwing her over the edge of the spiked pit. Lilith starts pushing Luz down as Ida tries to hold her up. Ida's curse starting to take hold as she's, she gives a message to Luz as she starts to be fully taken over. Take care of the house, take care of King and Hootie, and she thanks Luz for being in her life. She explodes into magic that can be seen from miles away as Albert flies to get Luz. She runs to an unconscious Ida who succumbs to the curse. Lilith restrains Ida, telling Luz to go home and takes Albert, saying that this world is theirs now. Luz walks back home from twilight to early morning, taking the whole night to walk home. Luz sees a surprise set for her by King and jumps out of the cake, asking where Ida went, and Luz, being in shock this entire time on their walk home, finally breaks down, and King and Hootie come to her comfort, and we get a to be continued. The credit scene is changed from its normal happy music video to a shot of the castle, a droning sound, and a heartbeat behind it all. I shed a tear twice, and I'm man enough to admit it. Don't judge me. When Ida gave that goodbye and Luz broke down at the end, I just couldn't handle it. This episode went from serious, joke, back to serious, back to joke, serious, lore, more lore, a giant beating heart, comforting connections, a heist, kidnapping, more sweet, then anger, then loss, and a breakdown, all bundled within 21 minutes. I am not okay. Okay, let's get back together and talk about the episode. This episode is great. It starts off with having undertones before leading to some levity and then some heavier tones. Lilith's struggles finally come to the forefront us, realizing she's not only trying to get Ida into the coven for her own sake, but because she wants her sister cured. That wasn't just a throwaway line to convince Ida, it's something Bellos is offering for real in return for Ida's service. It was something Lilith made part of the deal. Bellos didn't most likely didn't originally offer it. The fight with Hootie actually showed how strong Hootie actually is, we kind of forgot he's also a demon. The castle is full of interesting artwork and stained glass portraits of witches and Bellos. And there are many more relics that could be useful, but Lilith says they're all decrepit, so we don't really know how they may be used. Now, I want to talk about Bellos. This is the first time we see him on screen. He has made an amazing first impression. He is imposing, his throne room is interesting, he has a design, and his design is great. I want to know more about the heart and the figure next to him. Why does he eat magic from palismans like that? What does it do for him? Because it was hunched over before he consumed it, does, do we have like an Orochimaru situation going on? And his throne room is the most metal tech we have seen in the Boiling Isles, filled with metal tubing and gears that hold a beating heart, which can only assume is the Titan's heart. His voice is well great, it's imposing, distinct, and well played. Matthew Ray's well done, sir. As well, the heart must be connected to Bellos or his magic somehow, because when Bellos got heated, his heart started beating faster. Bellos is also a super interesting character that I can't wait to see more and learn about. Now Ida, it was really nice to see how much Ida appreciates Luz over this time, and it showed in that previous episode she is really starting to care for Luz, calling Luz her kid and getting anxious thinking about what it might be like to save her, or if Luz is in a tough spot like Rom. It really built up over the second half of the season, so seeing her go completely insane and fighting full force when Luz was in a legitimate life-threatening danger against something she already had a strong vendetta against no less, is completely understandable and completely in character. Hell, if I was in Ida's shoes, I would have been destroying all in my path until I knew my child was safe. Ida says she'd been doing magic all wrong before Lou showed up, and gave that heartfelt speech at the end, not knowing if she would come back. She used every last second to tell Luz what she wanted to say, and I don't even think it was all she wanted to say. She used the last bit of her magic to hold Luz up so she wouldn't fall into the spikes. The last of what she had left, the little bit of magic she used to hold up Luz so she wouldn't fall into the spikes. She knew the curse was going to come, but she put Luz above herself. Episode 1 Ida wouldn't have done that. 
She's grown majorly as a character, and I adore that. Gus and Willow were no pushovers in this episode either. They played a part in helping Luz learn and to do the heist, before it set off to the Owl House to be used as a messenger for Lilith. They tried to fight back, but they're kids, only knowing one track in school going against the full coven witch who knows all types of magic. No realistic way were they going to win, even with the relics that they barely knew how to use but they at least tried. Lilith being the one to curse it is also a twist I did not see coming. I heard the audio of why were you so easy to curse line on TikTok before, but I never really knew what it was until it was said in the line of the episode of Ida saying, I am better than you, and that's when it clicked. We also don't know why Lilith cursed Ida. My theory is jealousy. Ida was a witch with many talents, and Lilith saw the potential and didn't want it to get in the way of her getting into the coven, or she used it to limit Ida so that she may be forced to join one for her own safety. I don't know. If you can't tell, I write these about each episode directly after watching it, so I have no idea what's happening next. This episode was a slow burn that turned into a burning man flame before the ashes began to fall as it settled. It was truly full of emotional moments, proper build-up and drama, heartfelt moments with Ida at the cabin, and truly beautiful animation with the fight between Ida and Lilith, and don't even get me started on the animation. The amazing voice work on display, Ida's goodbye, you can hear the pain in the voice, like actual pain, real props to Wendy Malick, Luz's cries to get Ida to stop, and the vitriol in Lilith's voice when she yells about the curse. The music is also done beautifully, raising and falling when tensions rise and fall. It gives Bellows a menacing aura, and sad tones when Luz breaks down, it really got to me. It may be for different or hell even the same reasons, but this episode clearly gets a 10 out of 10. Beautiful work, and it left me at the edge of my seat for what is next. For some reason for me, this episode went by fast. It starts with King reciting a history book of the Boiling Isles being made atop the corpse of a fallen titan. Magic was known by all and was practiced freely. Then Bellows came, saying mixing magic randomly was wrong, and he made the covens. He said that he could speak to the island, and his power grew and became Emperor Bellows. He has since retreated into his castle, and rumors said that he's planning something big. Luz ignores this, and says she's going to go save Ida. Also, we get no opening to this episode, which cuts straight to the action. Luz explains her reasoning in Ida's armory. King eventually is convinced because he sees Ida like family and wants to come along. We cut to Ida and Lilith in the throne room, and Ida is trapped. Ida is still kind of being there, and it kind of shows that Lilith and Ida are very similar. Bellows comes in, and Ida is restrained by Bellows. Bellows summons his staff, which is more tech mechanical and it doesn't have a palisman. He zaps Ida into consciousness, giving her mind back while in Owlbeast form. Bellows says that she will leave Luz B for she is not what he is looking for. He is looking for the portal to the human realm which she wields. Ida refuses to give information and is sent away, as Ida yells for Lilith not for Bellos to hurt Luz. Bellos tells Lilith that he will not be healing Ida, and that all wild witches must be dealt with before the Day of Unity. Lilith is given the task to destroy Ida's staff, and Bellos leaves. The news is being reported that Lu where Luz is at, and the people are questioning if Ida really deserves her punishment, which is going to be petrification. We learn that she will be petrified at sunset that day at the Conformatorium. Willow, Amity, who is still in a cast, and Gus all see the news, and Gus and Willow state that they have to do something on a call. Luz gets mad and smashes the news ball, mostly getting enraged by seeing Lilith before her and King hatch a plan stepping on some no-touch grass in front of a guard to be brought to the Conformatorium. Once they get there, they break out using glyphs, taking out the guard they met in Episode 1 that asked Ida on a date. They, he is stuck between ice and is forced to draw a map for Luz. The crowd is formed outside to watch the petrification, and Gus and Willow split up to find Luz. Lilith also volunteers to find Luz after the guards claim that they have lost her. Luz finds Ida, who has regressed back to Owlbrain, but Luz uses a light spell to snap Ida out of it. Ida panics with Luz being there, and Luz does her best to help her escape, but her magic isn't strong enough. Ida has a heart-to-heart -heart with Luz. Us weirdos have to stick together, as said, and Ida gives Luz the key to the human realm, not knowing why Bellus wants it, but it can't. But they can't take any chances. With an I love you, they are separated as Ida is lifted up to her petrification. Lilith finds Luz, and with Luz in a rage, uses her magic against Lilith, who keeps trying to say she wants to talk. I just want to talk! Talk to the glyph, bitch! King, Lilith, and Luz go through the portal into the human realm. Both kinds of magic are somewhat weakened. It ends in a tackle where Lilith admits she was at. She talks to Luz about her and Ida's childhood and shows her a sharing spell that split pain. It shows Lilith and Ida training, Lilith behind Ida in a few ways, Ida being the stronger witch. 
They both joined, tried to join the Emperor's Coven, but there was only one spot available, so they were placed in a sanctioned witch's duel to see who would join. Lilith, knowing her odds against her sister were downright bad, went to the Night Market to get the curse, thinking it would only last a day. When the battle began, Ida forfeits, claiming that covens just weren't for her, as she let her sister win the match. As she left, however, the curse took hold, and she was ridiculed as Lilith was welcomed into the coven. She told Luz that Bellus lied to her. He wasn't going to heal the curse, and she now wants to help. She gives Luz Edith's staff, Albert included, and Luz decides to trust her for now. Luz takes one more look at the human realm before the door closes behind her. A live newscaster is doing a broadcast of Edith's petrification, and the ritual is about to start as Kiki pulls some switches. Lilith takes him to a pillar to the stage. Luz realizes there's not any guards around, while suddenly Lilith and King are attacked and captured by Bellos, who is sitting in a chair waiting for them in the darkness. He wishes to have a word with Luz, as King and Lilith are thrown into the chamber to be petrified with Ida. Ida tries to hurt Lilith, but King steps in, vouching for her. The machine is about to start, and we cut to Gus and Willow. Turns out the newscaster are Gus's dad, and I see the resemblance, and Willow takes the microphone, rallying the crown for Ida. Everyone starts chanting for Ida to be let go, even Principal Bump. We pan down to Luz and Bellos, who has Luz by the ankles. She flies out using the staff and points an ice point at Bellos, who teleports and agrees to play. Bellos launches Luz and they begin casting spells, but Luz is able to counter them with her glyphs. Bellos summons a green beast from the intro, but Luz uses a fire glyph to burst out. She gets restrained again, and Bellos asks if she had enough. Luz, being ever the card, says not even close and uses an ice glyph to smash part of Bellos' mask, showing a piercing blue eye different from the one we saw when he consumed the talisman. Bellos gives Luz a choice. If she wants her mentor to live, give him the key to the human realm, her only way home. The petrification begins, and Ida protects Lilith and King, and Luz can hear the screaming from below. Bellos ponders, asking if Luz thinks that they just want to invade the human realm, but apparently the Titan's plan is not so simple. He reminds Luz that Ida is on a timer as she's being petrified, and she needs to make a choice. Luz tears up and says I'm sorry to her mom in Spanish and hands over the door to the human realm. Bello sends her up on the podium, telling her to go be a hero, however Luz says that she may have lost, but Bello has lost as well. She left fire glyphs on the door to the human realm, causing it to explode, getting rid of her only way back home and Bellos's only way to the human realm. Luz looks down at Bellos, and he looks back, looking upset. Luz uses the plant glyph to take down the petrification machine, while Lilith helps Ida fight it off. Luz threatens Kiki with a fire spell to let them free, and they all fly away on Ida's back. Bellos appears before the crowd, saying that the Owl Lady should be an example of the consequences of wild magic. They make it back to the Owl House, and no amount of elixir could save Ida at this point. Lilith, to spare her sister, uses the pain split spell that they, we saw from the memory on Ida, sharing the curse with her. After Ida returns to form, they turn to Luz, Ida and Lilith now both having one normal eye and one gray eye and a gray streak in their hair, signifying the curse. Ida still can't do magic, and Lilith says that she also felt a loss in power. Ida's gemstone is also still fully black. Luz offers to teach Ida the human way of magic, which she says she looks forward to. Luz records a sort of video diary that she's acting like she's talking to her mom. She says she got a piece of Bellos' mask, and she knows that he's not invincible now. But she promises to find a way back to the human realm, saying, Leave the light on for me, I love you, in Spanish, as she turns off the lights for the night. Bellos and Kiki talk, Bellos saying that he's going to have someone watching over the members of the Owl House, showing a man in that weird owl mask that was next to his throne in the last episode. He says they have much work to do as they show a poor and the remains of the human world door being built. Now, this was a good episode. Not as good as the last, but it was close. It was all serious things except for the touch grass thing. It made a smart use of all sorts of magic and explained much more of the story and the context needed for Lilith and Ida. Bellos is now a very strong upfront antagonist instead of a distant one, and we now have some spying, someone spying on the Owl House. The Day of Unity is also something to worry about for future seasons. I love the fight between Bellos and Luz, even though it's clear that Bellos wasn't giving his all and pulling his punches, him getting surprised by Luz twice is great. It shows that Luz is much more clever than he thought, only thinking of her as a dumb teenager up to this point. Most main characters, aside from Amity, are used greatly here, Gus and Willow work in the crowd, the formatorium staff doing their jobs and failing, Lilith growing and using her learning as a stepping stone to fix her relationship with her sister, Ida coming back from the brink and having a heart-to-heart -heart with Luz before wanting to learn from her. King also stopped 
Ida from tearing Lilith apart and when coming up and came up with a grass plan. Luz, of course, was from the start. Luz was great, of course, from the start. Heartfelt moments and great action for her. She went toe to toe with Bellos, for Christ's sake. A lot happened and some really emotional strings were tugged. Luz thinking she might never see her mom again, said sorry to her while hugging the suitcase. She didn't even have time to process it. Ida thinking that she might be turned to stone, tries to send Luz home, telling her to burn the way back. A lot of sad. We also learned that Luz's magic is connected to the Boiling Isles, while Lilith's isn't. It might have to do with Luz's glyphs coming from the nature of the Isles, while Lilith's is connected to the Heart Sack, giving her a pool of magic to work with that she was able to show her memories in the Human Realm. What Bellos has planned with the Human Realm is also up for question, because apparently taking it over isn't the plan. And Bellos says it's the Titan's plan, not his own. If that's true, and it's not just Bellow talking himself up, what would the Titan want with the Human Realm? A lot of questions are left unanswered. This episode is great and has a lot for the rest of the series. This episode is a 9 out of 10. Great, but not as touching or as great as the last episode. So, The Owl House. This show is great! And would I say I'm a fan now? Yes! And I've only seen the first season. The average ranking of the episodes is an 8.3 is sadly bogged down by the 4 and 6 ranking for previous episodes that bogged down the 9 and 9.5s. 39 pages of script later and I could say that this show is great. I think I've earned it. Or at least a lollipop. This show is so f full of charm and intrigue, lots of things to look into and you can really get invested easily. I can see how Tumblr got so into it. There are lots of cool spells, great vocal performances, amazing animation barring a few hiccups, a fleshed out story with believable growth throughout, and a show that can handle both comedy and seriousness in the same swoop. That is hard to do, and more often than not, Owl House sticks to landing. It has a large and varied cast with more fleshed out background characters than most shows, and has hints to future events hidden in the show. It also handles the choice of found family wonderfully. Even though Luz still cares about her mom, if I were to ask Luz why she chose her found family in that moment with Bellos, I'm sure she would have said something along the lines of, they needed me more at the time and I could 100% agree. So far, this show is a spectacle, and I didn't even cover every single detail. If you watched this far in, and if you did, thank you, but if you did, I still insist you watch the show. Great vocal delivery, jokes, jokes that I didn't mention, and feeling the emotions through the music, vocal delivery, and animation are something I hope you can experience for yourself. I'm sure this will be a show many will look back on and say it's a classic, or at least the first season is. I'll have to eventually find out about the rest. I'll also be keeping an eye out for anything that Donna has worked for in the future. Hey, second recording, because some cool things came up. First off, I would love to thank Bushi Arts for this amazing thumbnail. You can find their Twitter here, I refuse to call it X, and in the description. Secondly, I would also like to show off the first fan art of the new era by Technicality, done by Seabass or AceofCards0715 on Discord, of my avatar in the Owl House style. You can send fan art to me in my Discord server or to me on this at on Twitter. Thank you so much, Ace. You've been a longtime fan and supporter of my changing content, and your art is amazing. Love how you added the details in the buttons and how you made my scarf a staff, even though canonically it's a bunger, but no one knew that at the time. Thank you again. Well, now what do I do? That's where you all come in. I plan to do an episode on another smaller show in the meantime, but afterwards, should I return for season two? Would you guys be okay with that, or should I continue on to something else? Please let me know in the comments. This is my first media review, and I hope I did well. It was wonderful having you in my cabin. So for now, support the original artists, get cozy, and enjoy your night. May the darkness guide you.